to come and uh, present and work with you today. Whoever you experience, whatever you take from it, try and connect it. So thank you so much, everyone, for giving of your time to be here. The connections you make today in, in here, in here, and between each other, I hope they're of value. So to set the scene for the day, we've got two um, keynote speakers, James Omar Bridge, General Secretary of UNESCO UK, followed by um, Julie Sato. Um, Julie San is uh, UNESCO ASMEC International Coordinator based in Paris. And they're gonna take um, 20 minutes or so just to set the scene for the day. So uh, Mike, thank you so much. That was tremendous. And I wanted to say bonjour, hola, um, kalispera, as I think it's now the afternoon in Greece. And I see there's so many Greek uh, participants and we have participants in Africa and uh, Lithuania around, around the world. So absolutely wonderful to be here. I will be speaking on um, connecting for peace. And it's so wonderful to be connected with you. We're all here connected. We're part of, and you are part of the wider UNESCO family by being part of this conference. I'll talk a little bit about the UNESCO constitution and the um, UK National Commission for UNESCO very briefly, and also about ASPNet, um, although my wonderful colleague from UNESCO will be speaking, so you'll get more detail from her about that, and then a little bit about peace itself. So the most important thing, and I hope you can see from the slide about, you know, we, what we need now is peace and connection and humanity. And this is something that has existed since UNESCO was founded. I mean, it's existed since humans have been around. And in the UNESCO constitution, it says that we must build the defenses of peace in the minds of men. Now, we've moved on, haven't we? It's building the defences of peace in the minds of women and men. And in fact, I think building the defence of peace in the minds of people, I think, sits so much better with all the values that we have in the world today. And it's about building that understanding together. So by us connecting, we are building understanding. And many people have said they want more tangible versions of peace. And I think this will be coming out of today's conference with the wonderful workshops. I also want to say a very quick thank you to the UK SPNet coordinator and organization, Steve Sinnott Foundation, part of the UK family and BT for running this conference and for her wonderful team and all the fantastic ASPNet schools here in the UK but part of that whole UNESCO family. UNESCO itself, as you know, was built out of the horrors of the Second World War. And people got together and said, what can we do to stop this happening again? It's got to be much more than about defense, much more about financial mechanisms, but linking through culture, science, education, and also interestingly, um, disinformation, fake news, etc. Something that's very prevalent today. So it shows humans haven't changed. And I'm really optimistic because it shows the changes that people spotted then are things that we can do now to make all the difference. So as part of that UNESCO family, the family that we have of all the organizations in this country and around the world, I want you to know that you're part of thousands of um, organizations in this country, for example, and likewise in Greece or Lithuania or um, in Japan, where we have a great speaker. It's not just World Heritage sites that people know about and people in this conference know about the ASPNet schools, but it's biospheres, geoparks, UNESCO chairs and things like refugee integration through the arts or through protecting cultural heritage in times of conflict. It's really, I think, important to understand that there is this extraordinary community that we have, and it's really precious. And that is what builds understanding. It's things on the ground. So it's what you are doing through the schools and through your everyday actions. And in fact, through things like today's conference, which of course will be written up and there'll be recommendations that will have a life beyond this and energize us and support us. So as part as well of this idea of peace and what's really in our hearts and is in the 
actions of the UNESCO designations in each country is what is motivating us as well. And you can see this quote from Ralph Waldo Emerson, peace cannot be achieved through violence. It can only be obtained through understanding. So I do think it's wonderful that it backs up UNESCO idea with culture that our, our poets also see that understanding is part of moving to what we're seeking to achieve through our practical actions that we'll be working on today. And as you can see, peace does not mean an absence of conflicts. Differences will always be there and we're all different. That's the thing to celebrate our diversity. Peace means solving these differences through peaceful means, through dialogue, education, knowledge, and through, and through humane ways. How wonderful that this is echoing the UNESCO constitution. And I really encourage you all as well to do have a look at it. it the preamble itself captures um, the main things. And UNESCO unites 193 countries that are working towards these goals. But really important, if you think of UNESCO as the tree, yourselves, ASPNet network, the geoparks, the World Heritage Sites, the biospheres, they're the roots and the fruit of UNESCO. They're the thing that keep it going. They are what build the understanding which creates big peace. And it is the only way that we will continue to create pace and sustainability. I also want to add for us thinking about today that the sustainable development goals are a really great way as well to capture some of these things. You know, so many countries and others measure things like GDP, which is, you know, of course it's really important, but how can we capture these other things that matter to us all? And the sustainable development goals a part of that. And education, a sustainable de development goal four, of course, is one of those absolutely key ones. So you right now are part of contributing to this and we can capture this and feed this into UNESCO through the ASPNet Schools Network, which my colleague will soon speak about. So to conclude, UNESCO is about building the defense in the minds of people, and that's us, and we're connected and we're connected together. It's only through our actions that we can tell the story of UNESCO, create the UNESCO story of UNESCO and pass things on now and to future generations. And there's a rather nice line here that you can see from uh, Francis of Assisi. While you are proclaiming peace with your lips, be careful to have it even more fully in your heart. And um, looking forward to an absolutely wonderful cop wonderful conference thank you thank you so much james for setting the scene so perfectly and also giving us a wonderful metaphor to to take through the day um unesco being the tree and, and us being the roots and the fruit let's hope a lot of that that is born today thank you so much for your for your time okay our second keynote speaker um i'd like to introduce uh, someone i've not met yet but i'm uh, really pleased to um judy saito um, so Julie Sand, thank you so much for your time. Julie is International Coordinator, UNESCO AFSNET. Thank you, Mike, and here, of course, Mr. James Sandridge, uh, Secretary General of the National Commission, uh, UK. My dear um, colleague, Ms. Anne Beatty, ASPNET National Coordinator in UK. Uh, dear ASPNET National Coordinators, educators, teachers, and students, dear colleagues, uh, konnichiwa, eh, konbawa for uh, my friends in Japan. I'm sending you warm greetings from uh, UNESCO headquarters in Paris. Um, first of all, uh, I'd like to again um, thank Anne for the kind invitation to address you all at this important occasion, uh, the ASPNET uh, UK uh, virtual conference, uh, Connecting for Peace. Um, and also, I can't agree with you more, James, uh, that you really capture the, the spirit of uh, UNESCO by quoting um, the preamble of the Constitution. Um, as you well know, international collaboration for peace is at the heart of our network. Uh, to foster international exchange, collaboration, and cooperation in inter intercultural dialogue um, has always been a core principle guiding the first scheme in 1953, uh, the 33 participating schools, including um, the John Bride Grammar School in North uh, Wales, were encouraged to work together and to share their projects on education for international understanding with each other. 
United Kingdom, as one of the 16 founding member states, supported the network's evolution since then. And I'd like to congratulate every educator and practitioner today for your outstanding, um, outstanding sort of uh, uh, an inspiring efforts in empowering young students through transformative education to take action for people and the planet. Next year, uh, in 2023, we will celebrate ASPNET's 70th anniversary. And I'd like to invite you all to contribute with your ideas and inspiring activities to celebrate cultural diversity and transformative action around the world. In this rapidly changing world, there's an urgent need to invest in transformative education, in learning that leads to transformation of self, the community, society, and the world. We need education that prepares and motivates people to action, to take action, and to advocate for and actualize human rights and gender equality, health and well-being, responsible global citizen, um, and for the sustainable future. The world needs peace. The UNESCO um, ASPNET expresses its solidarity with all Ukrainian students, teachers, parents among the 78 ASPNET schools in Ukraine and beyond who are facing these terrible times of conflict and violence. We are also touched by the actions rapidly taking immediately after uh, the whole um, situation changed the world um, among the ASPN communities in the neighboring countries for, active, uh, for actively offering support for the refugee students and teachers and exchange information among them to better support them as emergency responses. The Director General expressed in her statement the urgent need for protection of cultural heritage and schools. Uh, let me quote her. We must safeguard this cultural heritage as a testimony of the past, but also as a vector piece for the future, which uh, the international community has a duty to protect and preserve for future generations. It is also to protect the future that educational institutions must be considered sanctuaries. So I think that really captures the, what we really need to do now. And it has been never so important to cherish cultural diversity as a vector for peace, security and development for all. I'd like to therefore take this opportunity to congratulate ASPNET UK, supported by ASPNET Japan, for the inspiring Arts and Culture for Peace initiative, Finding Peace for Ourselves and Our Planet, which will be launched today. Again, congratulations. And this initiative is an outstanding example for this kind of transformative education in bringing together arts, culture, and education. It further combines all three thematic action areas of the UNESCO Associated Schools Network. Learning for global citizenship and a culture of peace and nonviolence. Reflecting about sustainability and fostering intercultural learning and the appreciation of cultural diversity and heritage. I very much hope that many ACE members around the world today will join this initiative. Now, as Japanese, I have um, a special attachment to the Japanese arts and cultural heritage forms, uh, namely Tanzaku or Peace Poems, No Theater, and Karesansu, Japanese Garden. I confirm that these are excellent entry points for exploring, learning, and understanding the heart of creation to building peace. Please allow me to also share my personal experiences in this regard. As I was brought up in a family where my grandfather was a master of no theater, I was lucky to go to see many no plays and learn about the essence of no spirit from my childhood. Though I myself 
have practiced the Western cultural forms such as uh, piano playing and classical ballet. I see that these are strong similar, there are strong similarities between the two cultures. The simplified format and strict discipline, which were en enriched through the history and tradition. This, in fact, enables us to freely explore universal values. Just to give an example, I had uh, also a chance to write an article as a journalist before joining UNESCO on a French dancer who had never been to Japan nor seen no due to her time just before the breakout of the World War II. But she was so touched by the principle of the concept of no theater and she performed a no play purely on her own in Paris. Similarly, I had an opportunity to feel the strength of another cultural form. It is was piano, belonged to an 18 year old Japanese girl who was killed in the bombardment in Hiroshima, but her piano survived. Today, the survived piano, it's called Akiko's piano, continues to attract pianists around the world like Martha Argerich to come and perform uh, on her piano, which now continues to deliver a message of peace from Hiroshima. What a strong message. So I'm sorry to be too long, maybe, but I'm very much looking forward to the very interesting sessions and workshops. And I wish you all a very fruitful conference. Thank you for your kind attention. Julie San, thank you so much for adding to James's words that it's wonderful to hear. I think for those of us who make small acts of peace day to day, how it is always part of a much bigger picture. And you've painted that so clearly, not least to say how music um, transcends time and can give us messages across time about what is important. Thank you so much for your time and for, for, for setting the day. Uh, day summary, we're now um, three presentations. Again, if you can um, make connections for peace between the keynote speakers and what you're about to hear over the next um, hour or so, um, that would be a wonderful way to engage. The first um, of three speakers I met for the first time yesterday. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting online uh, Mrs. Keiko Ogura. Um, Keiko-san um, taught me a few things about how to use Zoom, actually. Thank you so much for that. Um, and she said, um, Mike, what, you know, what, what, what should I do? What would you like me to present? Because um, I was there on the, that day. I said, it's simple. Tell your story of being there on that day. Thank you so much sharing your precious time for me. I'm so excited to be invited to join because my English, I started from 42 years old. And then my English is made in Hiroshima English. <laughs> you may find out many mistakes, but it's okay, I feel. Okay, and uh, today I want to share my experience with you uh, in 1945, when I was eight years old in Hiroshima, what happened around 6th of August. This is two months after the bombing in Hiroshima. And this was made, this film were made uh, by American soldiers. That means please understand those American soldiers must be contaminated with radiation, I'm afraid. Uh, this is uh, given from America and four different uh, directions pictures and the former uh, director put it together and made this film. Now we are facing at the south and the white area is the sea, Hiroshima Bay. And uh, until the seashore you see everything was destroyed and the camera is moving to east area you will see some buildings still left, but all of them were like skeletons. And uh, this was the business district, business area. So 
behind these buildings, so there was the city center, downtown area. Those buildings were banks, insurance companies, and the major companies' offices. See the chimney here. This direction behind the chimney, there is Hiroshima Railroad Station. In front of the station, you will see the hill like this. Hijiya, uh, the Futawayama Hill, we say. I was this, the other side of the hill. So if you see this hill from Hiroshima Station, you can imagine, imagine I was the other side of this hill. This is Hiroshima City, right, uh, showing the red part was completely 100% burnt down area, and the yellow part was completely destroyed. Of course, the white area until the seashore were damaged partially and then burned. You, can you see that this dot, yellow, uh, red one, that is the place where I was, where the bomb was dropped. This is the hypocenter, two kilometers, 2.4 kilometers away. This is the Hiroshima station. And then those days there were seven rivers and the being chased flames, many people jumped into those rivers. And then those rivers were full of dead, dying, and uh, they were floating and uh, to the sea, going down to the sea. And uh, many people fled, you know, uh, the, to the north, north area, and the many came to my area too. This is the area where the com uh, radiation contaminated the rain fell. This is Hiroshima city, and I was around here. You can see the uh, red spot. There, uh, I have experienced so-called the black rain, rain with radiation. This is two kilometers from the hypocenter. Uh, I'm sorry, one kilometer, 1,000 meter. This is the former elementary school I entered. I spent there one year and a half. And those days, uh, there were not many shelters in the town. So my father, was worrying about that we might be killed before we reached, all of my family reached to the shelter. So my father decided to leave. And then this is one kilometer. So we left here and a little bit before atomic bombing to two kilometers area. So my uh, classmates who were still this school, many of them died. This is where I moved. This is Mount Futaba. Uh, this hill is in front of Hiroshima uh, Railroad Station. And uh, this is my house. And uh, my house, I don't know whether you can see this shrine gate. I lived near Shinto Shrine, and uh, this is my elementary school I moved. And uh, there was a park near my house, between uh, school and uh, my house, where my father cremated the victims. Every day after the bombing, he cremated hundreds of people, uh, the victims. So the smell reached to my house. We were so scared. The father said, don't come to the park because there were hundreds of uh, the bodies tired in the park. And then my school, I was going every day and then with the anti air food put on, as soon as we heard the silence, I was running away and crying because I might be shot from the airplane, small airplane. 
I was afraid. And those days, uh, time to time, uh, you know, there was gun shooting from an airplane, not only atomic bombing, but the such kind of gun shooting from an airplane. So I was so scared because one day, and my part of my house started to burn because of this gun shooting. So I was so scared. This is the day, let me tell you about that day. I was on the road in the morning. My father said, Keiko, you shouldn't go to school today because today I feel something might happen because previous night around midnight, there was all of a sudden a uh, silent, you know, air raid warning. Several times until the morning, there were air raid warning. So father said something might happen. I was alone on the road. And then all of a sudden, 8 15, there was a tremendous uh, bright flash. Everything turned to white. I couldn't see any color. And then I was beating on the road. And then for a while I was unconscious. I opened my eyes. Then in front of me, only I saw a barn with a straw roof was burning. And everywhere was just dark, no sound. I couldn't understand around me, surrounding me, there were, uh, you know, branches and the framework broken, uh, furniture, so they were scattered. The first sound I heard was my little brother's cry. So I could see, oh, my house might be this way, you see? And then the reason why this uh, barn was burning is uh, the original flash, flame of thing started to burn like the straw roof, you see? It's far away, two kilometers from the hypocenter Grand Zero. So people in the city instantly, their clothes started to burn. So many people were fleeing, fleeing with burning clothes. Then I returned my home. Everything was broken and the ceiling was blown up. And then hundreds of pieces of glass uh, stuck on the wall. And then uh, fortunately, my father was just between those two sliding doors, not behind the glass door. So he was safe. So, and uh, later, my uncle reached my home on his back, over 20 of the, uh, the pieces of glass stuck and the bleeding battery I uh, came to my home. And uh, later, uh, I saw many, many people were coming like this. I step out, then I experience what's this? And the uh, charcoal gray color rain started to fall on me. On the other hand, my brother was working in the city those days until eight o'clock, uh, eight years old, those children stay in the at the home, but and over uh, 12, over eight, that means from nine to 12, had to evacuate into the mountain area. But from 13 to 15, those junior high students were working here. This is before and after. You see white area, this, that means uh, those students were breaking houses to make fire breaks, uh, uh, you know. I'm sorry. Fire break. You saw white area citizens and the students died. My brother was on this road, white area, you know, on the sixth, on the fifth, you see here. That was on the fifth, he could survive. On the sixth, on this road, uh, right now, it is called the Peace Boulevard in front of 
uh, Peace Park. This is Peace Park. 320 uh, children, students, around 13 or 14 died. No one could survive. This is after the bombing, nothing left. This area, everybody died. The, my house was Hiroshima Station. My house was the other side of this hill. Here you see, I lived here. My brother was around here and in the potato field and looking up. And the B-29, the bomber, he could notice. And then he could see the black dot was released, that's atomic bomb. Then he was lucky. Uh, he turned back a second before explosion. He was beaten on the ground, badly and unconscious. All the students were beaten and unconscious. And when they opened their eyes and they found many, many wounded people were coming toward the hillside. And then going to my area too, my brother and uh, climbed up the hill, they saw the city, city was burning and they going back uh, to my area, other hand, other side. Until my brother came, all of us thought our town, this town was the, uh, you know, the hypocenter, Grand Zero. But my brother coming back and said, no, 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 this is not the uh, Grand Zero, uh, the target. Target was center of Hiroshima city. City is completely damaged. We couldn't understand why. My brother said, I saw a single bomb was released. Why? City was destroyed by a single bomb? Yes, my brother said. And he said, many, many wounded people are coming to my area. Because I lived near a Shinto shrine and then those uh, people were uh, told and uh, in case something happened, go to the Shinto shrine or Buddhism temple, you will see that those places will be first aid station and you'll see doctors, people believe in coming to my area, to the shrine. This is the place, the shrine near my house. Many, many people making a line and they came to in front of me and then lie on the ground and uh, lying on the step. And the skin was peeling off. And then uh, I sensed the burnt hair first. And then there was no doctor, only one soldier with the tin bucket with the oil and apply. That's all. Here, I saw many people were dying, dying every day. Next day, from the hill, I saw Hiroshima City. I was surprised. Nothing left. Nothing left until the seashore nothing left but previous day what i saw was line of smokes people were cremating the big one uh, this side that's my father's work you see at the uh, he cremated over 600 victims in the small park Hiroshima City in 1945. Such a place, orphans, a bomb orphans return. Over 2,000 a bomb orphans return. Those elementary school kids stayed in the suburbs, but after uh, September, they returned and found something like that. I saw many children street children were living in the broken buildings. There was no orphanage at a hard time. But four years later, we got the budget to rebuild the Hiroshima city. Then 
this is four years later. And the next year, five years after the bombing, we chartered, we made from, uh, we made Hiroshima Cup baseball team. And that, that is, that was our dream. Still now we have uh, that baseball team. 12 years later, Hiroshima City was like this. And the museum is over there. Yeah, you see the museum. You see the museum. For the first time, there was the first uh, anti-atomic and uh, hydrogen bomb uh, movement. So many, many people around the world came and they saw what nuclear weapon meant, means. And now this is uh, the Senate we have every year around 5,000 people passed. And then this is the present number last August. This year, uh, more names will be added. Not only Japanese, uh, around 10 American soldiers and the Asian people who are studying in Hiroshima and the, and the surface of the chest, uh, the, you know, Senate, it is said, let all the souls here rest in peace for we shall not repeat to the evil. This is Hibakusha, we Hibakusha's pledge. And please understand that every time we see this, we means you and me. That means human beings all of the world should say the same words. We shall not repeat the evil. Thank you so much. This is the end of my story. I thank you everybody that you share you you share my story. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, um, Keiko. That was a wonderful story and very heartwarming. Thank you for sharing your story with all of us here today. Thank you. And uh, one thing I want you to remember, nuclear weapon is not a, just a huge weapon destroyed uh, so too many uh, buildings and people, but please remember radiation. Radiation stays in, you know, uh, the, we have been suffering because of radiation. And until my birth, the last moment of my uh, children's birth, I was worrying uh, if, you know, healthy baby or not. And then I recall those days, uh, you know, kind of discrimination. We shouldn't tell we were there. If I say I was in Hiroshima, we cannot get married. Such kind of worry we have and still we have concerning radiation. Yes. Okay. Be yeah. understood. Yes, and I, I think that uh, that is one of the reasons why we're here today is to share the effects of war and how important it is for us to remember um, that we're all connected. And so what is happening in one part of the world really affects everybody in the whole world, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. So thank you very much um, again. And um, I will... Um, introduce the next speaker. I'd like to introduce um, Jeanette Jong, who is a, power, a poet, writer, designer and producer. She was born in London and Jeanette has worked nationally and internationally in higher education. In addition, for over 25 years, she has been involved in the organisation and facilitation of many international education and creative arts collaborations. The UNESCO ASPNet Arts and Culture for Peace initiative, Finding Peace with Ourselves and Our Planet, is the latest of the educational activities supported by Jeanette and her colleagues. We invite you to participate in this project over the coming year, especially as you will have heard earlier that 
ASPNet will be celebrating 70 years of uh, being in uh, of being in 2023. So um, over to you now, Jeanette. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, it's very difficult to follow Keiko-san, I must say. Um, it's very touching to hear her story. Um, nonetheless, I am delighted to uh, join this conference and uh, to introduce and to launch the uh, UNESCO ASPNET Arts and Culture for Peace initiative. Uh, first of all, very quickly, enormous thanks to Anne for taking the lead for the conference and her colleagues, and also in taking the initiative forward. Um, she is the, going to be um, one of the lead national coordinators uh, for the initiative. I'm grateful too to James and Julie San and all of her colleagues, including um, Eric, uh, for their support and guidance over the last year or so in developing this program. And of course, especially to Keiko San for her story. Um, I'm going to be speaking for about 20 minutes. I'll try and keep it as short as I can, uh, leaving time for questions. And Anne and Mike, our hosts for this session, will handle any questions that you have. Um, please put them in the chat and they will um, uh, allow me to answer those um, towards the end. And there's no need for you to take notes um, because uh, I will make the, um, this uh, presentation available um, after this conference and also on the initiative website. So the conference is called Connecting for Peace. And this arts and culture initiative is all about such connections, past, present and future. The initiative is also about reflection and action. This quote by Gandhi perhaps gives us a taste of both the reflection and action needed Perhaps at first glance, it appears to be about protecting the world's forests, but it is also possibly a reflection on what we are doing to ourselves and as well as the forests, destroying and not maintaining. I think if we could keep this reflection and action concept in mind as we think about the new initiative and the part that you can play in it, um, that would be good throughout uh, this presentation. We could also reflect that Gandhi said this during his lifetime, and uh, if we think about the major historical events, one of which you've just heard about from Keiko-san um, and uh, other things that he witnessed in his lifetime, we might, uh, given the present day challenges for our planet, consider that it is perhaps even more poignant today. Today, I'm going to talk about three Coventry pilot projects that were part of our um, bigger project between the stones. And I'll tell you a little bit about that. Um, why the UNESCO action areas are important to everybody. Something about the arts and culture for peace activities. How schools and other educational establishments can participate, who does what with whom and with what effect. Next steps perhaps, and um, leave time for your questions. So I'm going to move straight into um, the origins of this initiative really, and the pilot projects began with um, a, a play that I wrote called Between the Stones. This is Kinue Oshima performing Between the Stones at the world premiere at the South Bank Center in London at the end of January in 2020. Um, it's an colla intercultural um, collaboration between uh, Japan and uh, the West, I would say, more than just the UK, Japan and the West. Um, and um, it was one of uh, the Between the Stones play formed the umbrella, if you like, and uh, running in parallel to the three year development. Um, of this play, we uh, ran a whole series of education and outreach activities. Um, they were with theatres, museums, schools, universities, um, the British Library, the Japanese Embassy, lots of organisations participated in those educational and outreach activities. And the Coventry projects were part of uh, this Japan UK project, and it ran from 2018 to 2021. There were three peace projects by five UK primary schools um, led by what we called 
the Coventry's young ambassadors. They were aged between, I was told at the time, between eight and 10. You can find out a lot about the, the detail of these projects um, on the website, and there are lots of photographs and um, background material. And also later, Rebecca is going to be talking specifically about one of them, and I'll explain who Rebecca is in a moment. What arose out of this collaboration with these five schools was a project which was called Coventry Cities of Peace Schools Project. It combined art, culture and education and inspired, um, we hope, peace, reconciliation and the sustainability of our planet. What was important for all the projects is that there was a lead person and that person was um, one of the deputy head teachers in Coventry at one of the five schools, Rebecca Bolands. She's with us today um, and you'll be seeing more of her later. And of course, of course, can join me answering questions later. Here's a brief outline of those um, three projects. The three projects were the Tanzaku Peace Poems, which led us to Peace Trees, no theater, which has led us to performing stories and songs uh, for peace, and the Kari Sansui Garden, which has led us to Gardens for Peace. So all three projects have their roots um, in this initiative. And very quickly, just to run through um, some of the, the key elements from each of the projects. The first one, um, which resulted in an exhibition of peace trees from tragic loss to peace, this we found was a relatively simple project for teachers and children to undertake in the classroom. It resulted in 180 Coventry Young Ambassadors creating their own individual peace poems. Um, they're called Tanzaku when they're written on poem cards that are hung from wind chimes, furu, um, and the children made their own wind chimes from recycled materials. The efforts of all of those children who each made a wind chime were put together and their efforts together added value and strength to the children's messages of peace and reconciliation by creating the Coventry Young Ambassadors peace trees. These particular peace trees were unusable um, and that's because they designed them for an exhibition and we used them for in fact uh, three exhibitions in total. And those exhibitions um, gave us opportunities for sharing the children's learning, their peace messages um, at these public events. There were two in Coventry, uh, one to mark the 100th anniversary of Armistice Day at Coventry Cathedral. Uh, the second one was at the embassy, Japanese embassy in London as part of our Between the Stones event. And the third one was back in Coventry at uh, Coventry Cathedral as part of a massive um, uh, Coventry uh, Japan um, Festival for Arts and uh, there were lots of arts uh, activities taking place but the showing of the children's work was um, was part of that. Here you can see um, their, their work exhibited. Moving on to the second project which was the following year in 2019 um, the young ambassadors perform peace and reconciliation stories and songs. Again, that some of the key elements was that as part of that project, they were to study uh, conflict and peace, and they studied the impact of World War II on Coventry and Hiroshima. Part of their intercultural learning was not only the arts, but actually learning about the history and culture of another country. Um, we took Hiroshima, it's also uh, now an international city of peace like Coventry, and there was a virtual session, as we have just heard from Keiko, she spoke to the children of Coventry um, from Hiroshima. As I said, they learned about another cultural art form, no theatre, 650 year old um, theatre art form. Um, and two workshops were organized for the children by the Between the Stones team. They were able to work with uh, at least a couple of our actors. One of them was uh, a very well-known professional no actor, Kinue Oshima from the Oshima No Theater. In, uh, by coincidence, um, she actually comes from um, Hiroshima Prefecture. 
and her family has a theater there. We also included our mask maker who came on another occasion, Kitazawa Hideta, and um, the, the whole of this uh, project was with the support of the Japan Society, as well as many others, but the Japan Society actually worked with us from the beginning, and they ran a couple of workshops, including um, uh, a mask making workshop that the children participated in. And this is a picture of the children learning the shiori. This is a, um, uh, a symbolic gesture of sorrow um, where you're catching your tears. And um, that was a, one of the introductory days that we ran. Uh, here is, um, you can see Kinue up there, our mask maker, uh, Kitazawa-san, and um, also one of the children making her masks. And then finally, they created their own travel songs and a short no influence play about conflict, peace and reconciliation. And examples were performed uh, publicly at Coventry Cathedral once as part of the uh, 2019 Hiroshima Day. Um, and it was the first time that, although they have this day um, every year in Coventry Cathedral, um, they mark uh, the Hiroshima Day. It was the first time that children had participated in that event. Um, and this is one of the children delivering her work. Um, and the second occasion was uh, as part of the Coventry City of Cultures um, Japan Arts Festival, the one that I mentioned earlier, um, and several children participated again at Coventry Cathedral later in 2021. And finally, of the three projects, um, the Coventry Young Ambassadors Japanese Peace Garden. Um, originally, we thought we would just uh, perhaps work on desktop designs of gardens with the children. But I spent a day working with a group of children from a number of schools. And um, we said, what if we were to design um, a full size garden? What would we include in it? And the children uh, together came up with many, many ideas for this um, that are very poignant and very moving. And um, I think if you um, listen this afternoon to Rebecca's account, she's going to go through a lot more of this. So I will just pick up some of the key things. The children created a beautiful, mindful space, Kari Santo Gardens, you can go and be at peace with yourself, with the world. Um, and it was very much uh, something that the children thought about right from the beginning when we started um, thinking about the design of the garden. So the children were involved from idea to reality, not just in the design and the planning, but also in the delivery, including finally the opening ceremony that the mayor of Coventry and the um, Japanese ambassador came and opened the garden as part of um, this uh, Coventry City of Culture um, activity and the Japanese Arts Festival. The garden, um, when you read about the garden, you'll find that it supports all of the UNESCO action areas. It also benefits communities, uh, both locally and we hope internationally. Um, and it was supported by many collaborators, including the Japanese Garden Society um, in the UK, who actually did the construction together with um, various construction company workers and companies that supported the garden and many funding partners. And Rebecca is going to tell you a lot more about all of the partners involved because she was in fact uh, the linchpin for keeping the whole project together and on track and uh, indeed delivered. Uh, lots of people gave their time, but I think all of these collaborators really participated in this project because of the children's involvement. It therefore turned out to be a transformative project for all of us, not just for the children um, who followed the whole project through from beginning to end, but all those involved. And that would not have been possible without Rebecca's effective local leadership and management. So here's a, one picture of the garden. She's going to show you lots more this afternoon. And also you can see just how literally stuck in the children got uh, when they were involved um, and the workers were so engaging um, in helping the children understand all those processes. 
There's a little book, you can find that on the website, all about those projects. Um, and we are hoping that the pilot projects will provide a number of generic points that may be useful to others, perhaps in lots of different ways, as part of this UNESCO Arts and Culture for Peace initiative. And here's just a few additional thoughts. We were reminded, Rebecca and I thought about this, and we, we know lots of other people have too, um, that young people have a very good understanding and can synthesize effectively um, humanitarian concepts uh, such as the need for peace, reconciliation and sustainability. They have a great capacity to accept and learn from other cultures very different from their own. And they're also keen to keep an open mind and positively seek out opportunities and additional benefits wherever they find them or whether they can be created along the way. And finally, they do appreciate projects that can work on a number of levels to add value and benefit. And that uh, this was not only possible during the way that these projects evolved, but it became critically important. So with that, I'm going to move on now to the initiative. Um, why the three UNESCO ASPNET uh, action areas are important to everybody. Julie's already taken us through these, but it is now vital, it's clearly vital for the world to tackle probably the three of the greatest challenges facing humanity. The UNESCO action areas are not only vital, they're interrelated and they're urgent for everybody. But without peace, and it's one of the reasons we've called this the Four Peace Initiative, without peace, we cannot achieve sustainability. And without having a tolerant relationship between cultures, we will not have peace. Without peace, all of our human rights are at risk. So we believe that art has the potential to provide a creative mirror through which we can reflect on our impact on society. And that's why we're hoping that the Arts and Culture for Peace initiative will encourage action that supports the action areas and at the same time will benefit every individual child involved as well as our wider communities. We're hoping, I'm gonna put all three up, that uh, your school or your educational establishment could develop any of the following transformative arts and culture for peace uh, projects for the benefits that we've just discussed. If it's the eForest for Peace initiative that you're interested in, and you can sort of see where the roots from the Coventry work came from, but here we want to broaden it out. And I think all the speakers prior to me have actually given you ample good reason for cons considering this on any level you wish. Um, to develop artistically dynamic peace trees. Now these could be real or imagined that involve the creation of peace poems or peace images that highlight the importance of living in peace with ourselves, our communities and our planet. I say real or imagined because if you want to take this project into your community and your community happens to have local projects that are, for example, planting trees, which we know is going on so many places all around the world, then why not join your project with one of those sorts of projects and add value to um, any project that is going on. This is all about connecting for peace, connect to as many projects, people, um, organizations as you can to highlight the importance of living in peace with ourselves and our communities and of course our planet. In the Performing Arts for Peace, it's an opportunity for young people to develop and perform their own stories, plays and songs that reflect our global citizenship and cultural diversity and challenges and the challenges of ensuring a more peaceful world. And finally, for the Gardens for Peace, this is an, again an opportunity to create peace gardens that can support the well-being of others, as you could see in the Karisansri Garden, um, it is such a place, as well as convey the critical and urgent importance of living more peacefully and sustainably with nature, ourselves and our planet. And with this one, if you want to think outside of the box of a brand new garden, which you could think about if you want to, you could also consider if there are um, uh, land development projects going on in your area, why not have a children's garden as part of those developments? 
You see them going on all the time, developments that are needed, perhaps following conflict, uh, perhaps for the redevelopment or renovation of, of, of areas. Why not build your project into uh, those kind of um, opportunities that may exist already? And finally, whatever you come up with, we're hoping that these outcomes can be shared internationally through the UNESCO, uh, Paris and other networks. How can you participate? Well, it's open to um, pre-primary, primary, secondary, technical and vocational education in formal, non-formal settings and teacher training. That sounds like everybody. And I heard from uh, our Japanese colleagues the other day that they also want to involve um, uh, university professors who could work with schools on their projects. So I don't think this project will exclude anybody really, but the primary group who can take the lead are really the children. Um, so what would they do? They would work flexibly. They could work on one, two, three, or perhaps one project that combines all of these. There's a great deal of flexibility uh, built into the initiative. Schools, we do ask them to begin their own study of conflict and peace. We've heard from the other speakers how important it is to learn from history and not to repeat the same mistakes. Um, and in realizing their ideas, we are asking um, uh, young people to learn about and use a less is more creative and philosophical approach, both to, uh, to reflect the spirit of sustainability, uh, but also to see how this will uh, work, not just in a Japanese culture, but um, it's, a, it's a, an artistic, shall we say, um, development that can go across many different cultures. And it will be very interesting to see children's work. I think it is important that it also offers um, a notion of accessibility to schools. This isn't about you're a school that has lots of resources or a school that has, doesn't have any resources. It's about an initiative that should be open to all schools of any kind. Who can you work with? Well, you could just work within your school, within your education establishment and develop a new project if you wish, if you've got great ideas for that. Or as I've been saying all along, you can join a project and add further value to existing work. And you can collaborate with other artists and other partners as we have done um, across the, the three projects. And what are we hoping for? With what effect? What are going to be the benefits? You should look to your projects benefiting your local communities, as well as when you share them internationally, the international communities, but most importantly, they should represent the ASPNET action areas. So next steps. I think we should say, where are we now? If you are a school, ask yourselves, are we starting a completely new project or is this going to build on a local initiative um, and add value? Where are you going? Think about um, which of the action areas will be your main focus, where is your central activity going to be, and who is going to benefit from what you achieve? How will you get there? Well, you consider the conflict and peace study, uh, consider how you can apply the less is more approach, and uh, consider all of the inputs, the resources, human and physical that you will need, the processes, how you're going to do it, the outputs, what will come out of it, and the benefits, the outcomes. And finally, how will we know if we've been successful? Well, given your shared vision, your success criteria should really um, demonstrate what impact and benefit you wish for your individual students and your wider communities. Hopefully that will bring you to a new current position. Um, we can talk a lot more about those, these sorts of things at other times. The initiative will be reviewed each year. Um, we've said initially perhaps it could run for three years if uh, there's a great deal of interest. Um, and we should be saying to ourselves, where are we now? We are starting with the Coventry pilot projects, things that you can learn from. Um, we've asked you to focus on the benefits for other regions and countries and collectively give voice to uh, children so that their voices can add to the action areas and give it greater international volume, depth and meaning. And how will we get there? Well, um, find your local person. I do believe that galvanizing others 
um, is really important. And um, finally, we would also look at the success criteria that the national coordinators believe are possible in your area. Um, and um, to finish, we hope that this opportunity will demonstrate that peace can prove to be stronger than conflict and division. To illustrate that um, from mighty oak trees, um, from acorns, sorry, mighty oak trees do grow. Um, and uh, that the individual creative elements of every student will together help us work as global citizens more effectively. And I think I've come to the end of my time. So um, I perhaps just leave you with the last one, which is to give voice to the children. The future belongs to them. Their ideas about how these action areas can be strengthened do matter and can support the international community effectively um, by creating opportunities from all of the challenges which lay ahead. So we welcome your questions. We hope you're going to learn lots today and that you'll put all of your good work to use and join the UNESCO Arts and Culture for Initiative. Wherever you are in the world, you're all welcome. We value all contributions. And with that, I think we can declare the initiative officially launched. Thank you very much, Jeanette. Um, that was a really interesting and informative presentation. Um, we've actually run out of time for questions. Um, we've slightly overrun, but we have got a couple of messages in the chat. Um, James Bri Bridge has said that the peace trees fit beautifully with the image of the tree roots and fruit of UNESCO. And could schools also relate this work to the sustainable development goals, for example, SDG 16, peace and justice, and quite a lot of people have said that that's a really good idea. Um, we've got some um, uh, people from the Gambia and from the UK who've said that very inspiring ideas and that they'd like to develop um, something. So yes, we've had quite a lot of um, interest um it's unfortunate that we can't haven't got time for questions because we have to um, introduce the next speaker however there will be an opportunity to look at this um again this afternoon when rebecca bollens talks about how it happened in practice in coventry and we'll be able to hopefully get some questions later on do put questions in the chat and i will try and send you some information about the initiative and how you can get started links etc to the website so thank you very much jeanette um, for that presentation and the launch yeah. of Forgive me for running over a um, little bit. I am looking at the questions and uh, people's comments and I'll, I will uh, read them all. Um, and thank you all very much indeed. It looks as if we will be sharing the presentation. Everybody has been asking, can we share the presentation? And yes, of course, we will do so. Um, and uh, we should say, Anne, that actually people can ask questions of you and me. I'll act as an advisor for the initiative after the conference um, and engage with uh, groups that are interested to join. We'd love to hear your ideas and discuss those with you. Yes, definitely. We'll put some links in the chat so that people can connect. Thank you very much, Jeanette. My pleasure. It gives me great pleasure now to introduce Tricia Feliciano. Tricia is a youth advocate for Greenpeace and Tricia is also a medical student so we're particularly grateful that she's torn herself away from her studies to come and speak to us today. And joining Tricia in her presentation will be Eleanor Michaels, who's a campaign manager for Greenpeace. Thank you. Tricia. Hello, everybody. So I hope you've enjoyed the conference so far. It's looking like you have an amazing lineup ahead. I also hope that what I'll be talking to you about today will be of some use, but before that, I thought I'd introduce myself a bit more. So as you know, I'm a Greenpeace speaker, but first and foremost, I'm a student, I'm currently at University College of London, which is why I'd like to think I know a bit about how to inspire change in students, or at least be able to give a unique perspective on it. While studying medicine, I've had the amazing opportunity to bring about sustainability changes, both at my own university with the support of staff there and at other medical schools across the world in my role at the student-led organisation, the Planetary Health Report Card. 
I'd like to think that just as I've been motivated to create change and do things such as go to um, Antarctica, many more students will be motivated by educators like yourself as a result of this fantastic conference to do even more incredible things as well. So what I hope to do today is share with you what I've learned both in trying to enact change as a student and as a quote unquote teacher through my role as a speaker. But anyway, that's a little bit about me. Here's an overview of what I'll be going through. The first thing I'm going to talk about is the role of sustainability and peace and vice versa, about how education and sustainability is vital to achieving both a peaceful and sustainable future. But most importantly, I'll be talking about the ways in which you can go about teaching environmental sustainability to students. What I think is important to remember in order for you to inspire change in students. So I think most people today have at least some awareness that environmental sustainability is important. However, it's still vital that educators teach this in schools so that it's no longer most people, but everyone. And so that it's no longer an awareness, but it's a well-informed understanding of the issues that we face. For example, teaching about how climate change can lead to food scarcity. Most people probably know that as different regions of the earth get hotter and experience less rain, it will get harder and harder to grow crops there. But there's also an issue that as the concentration of carbon dioxide in the air increases due to air pollution, it's been found that crops won't be as high in nutrients. Our impact on soil is also worrying as aggressive industrial practices and few efforts to stop soil erosion are thinning topsoil layers. Relatively soon, certain places will be unable to sustain crops. Water scarcity is also a major problem of the Earth's water. Less than 3% is fresh water. And of this, only a third is accessible to us as the rest is locked in glaciers and permafrost, for example. The water we drain from aquifers is also highly limited is not, and is not being used sustainably. Aquifers do refill, especially ones near the surface, but deeper aquifers may have taken centuries or millennia to fill, and many become irreversibly emptied as the rock they were stored in compacts. This also causes land sinks on the surface, like in Mexico City, where cracks are forming in buildings as the ground shifts beneath them. Of the 37 major underground water reservoirs we rely on in the world, 21 are on track to be irreversibly emptied if used at the rate we're currently using them. A changing climate also has further impacts in the vein of creating uninhabitable land. Consider, for example, the effect of changing sea levels flooding certain low-lying regions, or consider the effect of extreme temperatures in many equatorial or tropical regions, increasing the incidence of heat stroke, for example, and of certain other cardiovascular or respiratory disorders. Climate change is making it difficult, if not impossible, to live in certain places. It also has an impact on natural disasters. Natural disasters such as hurricanes, floods and wildfires all leave devastation in their wake, causing deaths, damaging livelihoods and undoing progress. And climate change not only increases their incidence, but also their destructive potential. So it's clear that climate change and unsustainable use of resources can create situations that lead to conflict in multiple different ways. When critical resources that support basic human needs in people's livelihoods are stretched, desperation can lead to both civil unrest and international tensions. I go, in a world without sustainable behaviors, it will be very difficult to achieve peace. Conversely, in order to achieve a sustainable future, it is crucial that we also achieve international peace. We need to act quickly and decisively to limit global warming to under 1.5 degrees Celsius. And this will only be possible with international collaboration, where we can share innovative ideas and help each other towards solutions for the climate crisis. Now, I may not be an expert on peace, but I am a firm believer that education is key to achieving sustainability. 
only by helping this generation and the next and all future generations to make choices informed by their effect on the planet can we hope to become a sustainable society. But where do we begin? How do we and how should we teach sustainability in schools? I know this is hardly revolutionary, but I believe this comes in three steps. First, providing people with the right information. Second, making sure people understand why that information relates to them, their life and their future, why it should be important to them. And third, helping people believe that their actions and choices can make a difference. This is what I want to stress though. If you leave with anything from what I said in this talk, I'd want you to leave with the idea that simply providing the information is not enough. The most important thing you can do is not increase environmental knowledge, but it's still in people the belief that they can be part of creating a sustainable and peaceful future. What we want to avoid is this question, so what? If this comes up, the student may understand the material, but not the message. What we want, our goal, is to turn this so what into a what now? What can I do now? We ideally want an end scenario where students are keen to get involved where they are able to, where they are asking questions such as, what can I do now? The first step I said before is to make sure people have the information. Sustainability education needs to be added to the existing curriculum. The most effective way would be to integrate it throughout the curriculum, not just in one-off sessions, isolated modules. For people to fully understand the importance of sustainability, it should be added whenever it could be relevant. So people can see the role sustainability plays in several different fields. What this is trying to achieve is for sustainability considerations to become a natural step in the thinking process and not a revolutionary one. And in the same way, we do not take notice when considering the financial implications for strategy or idea, it should become second nature to think about the long-term potential for a product idea or plan and how it would impact natural systems at each point in its lifespan. For example, in geography, when discussing the structure of cities and urban land use, the differences between rural, urban and suburban regions are discussed. And so the level and types of pollution seen in each region could also be mentioned. In physical education or sports classes, there could be a discussion on the health and sustainability benefit of active transport, such as cycling, whilst ensuring all students feel comfortable using these methods of transport. Whilst doing science experiments, you can raise awareness of and point out the waste that can occur, and you can have discussions for the reasons behind choosing materials and tools. This could include what they're made of, like plastic versus glass syringes, and also the extent of waste can also be discussed when thinking about bigger labs and the implications of um, the research that's done in those sorts of labs. I have no doubt you'll be able to come up with much more immediately relevant examples for your own classrooms though. The ways in which you integrate sustainability education also matters. Making sessions interactive, as I'm sure you already know, can get more students interested and engaged in the lesson. You could perhaps, if space allows, start a vegetable patch, where students can discuss the benefits of local procurement, sustainable farming, and actually learn how to garden, which they can hopefully take into their later life. These discussions might be better had in the classroom though, as debates, for instance, where they can help foster their skills and empathy and their ability to back up their beliefs. These discussions could also be in the form of small group presentations to encourage independent exploration of the subject, both individually and as a group. School trips are also an excellent way to show students the real impact, the real life impacts of climate change on our environments and on people's lives. For example, one of these trips could be to a beach to pick up plastic waste. By framing the trip as an investigation, you can both give back to a local natural environment and demonstrate the proliferation of waste in our world by the magnitude of items students find 
and by the variety in their possible places of origin. If food classes are given at your school, it could be a great idea to do a couple of sessions cooking vegan food to demonstrate how affordable and easy it can be to make, as well as how nice it can be to eat. In addition to discussions of the wider environmental and health benefits of a plant-based diet. Lastly, simple group quizzes on the topics mentioned thus far can go a long way to helping students become more confident in their knowledge. And it is also a great way to get people thinking about certain environmental issues, especially if the answer to a question may be a bit shocking or hard to believe. For example, the question of how big the Great Pacific, great, the great Pacific Garbage Patch is, and the answer being three times the size of France can definitely be shocking and memorable. This brings me to the importance of the hidden curriculum. The hidden curriculum, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with, is the concept describing everything a student learns from at school, which was not explicitly intended to be taught. These can include social lessons they learn while at school, work habits they develop, and the values they come to take on. Thus, considering the curriculum is essential to teaching sustainability, as it is one of the value systems we wish students to take on even after they leave. As an educator, this means that you need to not only be teaching about sustainability, but also practicing it. Students may not take a teacher seriously if they see that the values that they teach do not translate to their real world actions. This extends to the campus or school buildings as well. If there are improvements that could be made to the sustainability of the school and yet aren't being attempted, a student may question how important sustainability can really be. To fully embed the importance of sustainability, students need to see that the school itself takes sustainability very seriously and is actively trying to improve their campus's sustainability. This could include energy saving methods, being powered by renewable energy, having available compost bins, eliminating single-use plastic from school premises, and facilitating public transport for students and staff. Now, I've just listed quite a long list of examples, but I'd like to stress that not all of these need to be done in order to show your commitment to sustainability. What's important is that you are actively trying to improve. Schools also have the unique opportunity to be able to engage their students with their ideas. The experience students can get from implementing their own ideas in a safe and supportive environment can often be undervalued. And these activities foster creativity from an early age, which helps students become adept at approaching more complex sustainability issues in the real world. Students could, for instance, get involved with trying to improve campus sustainability alongside staff. This gives them the opportunity to be creative with their ideas and see how things may fare in real life. It gives them the experience of trying to problem solve and prepares them to be able to do this in their own line of work later on in life. Even perhaps pioneering the introduction of sustainability measures in their own workplace. Moreover, having been designed at least in part by a student, also increases the likelihood of initiatives being followed by other students, thus increasing its chance of success. These opportunities for student involvement can be done by having a student sustainability council, or by having a working group set up, or by having perhaps an annual sustainability hackathon, a friendly group competition to design a solution based on a prompt. Giving students these experiences of being able to create change is one of the most important steps in giving them the hope that a sustainable future is possible, which is why it's good to be able to answer the question of what can I do in relation to what students can do in the fight for sustainability. Students can more often than not feel overwhelmed by all the information about climate change that's out there. So presenting them with, the possible, with what's possible for them to help with can help them feel less overwhelmed. Indeed, as an educator, if you raise the awareness of how students can go into the field of sustainability or incorporate sustainability into their future careers, 
can help students keep positive about the future and also fuel enthusiasm for future further actions. This can also be done by signposting students to external local sustainability initiatives that they can get involved in. For example, volunteering for a charity or competing in external competitions. And then again, this would help them keep hopeful about the future by helping them complete possible tasks in what they may feel like is an impossible situation. Ultimately, by teaching sustainability in the ways that I've mentioned, you can help inspire sustainable change. Encouraging a sustainability mindset in students can lead them into carrying important philosophies into their future lives and careers. Whether the effect is more direct, with a student deciding to have a career focused on sustainability, or the effect is more indirect, with a student's everyday environmental considerations having a knock-on effect on others, each and every student that ends up contributing to a more sustainable future is an achievement. Currently, we generally rely on the work of many individuals pushing for change who feel very passionate about sustainability. This, however, will not be enough for the future. Considering sustainability in all aspects of life must be the norm, not the exception, if we are to create both a sustainable and peaceful future. We need to reach the majority of, if not all people, to make a real lasting difference. And this, I believe, will be through education. And this is just a reminder that I like to have at the end of almost every talk that I give, that no action you take is too small. Doing what you can is more than enough, trust me. And I'm now gonna hand over to my colleague, Eleanor, who will be um, giving you some more information and signposting you to some more information that Greenpeace offers. First of all, thank you so much, Tricia. Like that was such an inspiring talk and a great overview of how you can include sustainability uh, teaching into your work. Um, so yeah, thanks for your time today. I just wanted to share a bit more about the Greenpeace Teacher Programme and how that can really kickstart and support um, your sustainability, but also um, global citizenship learning. So we currently have 120 speakers all across the UK, um, and they offer free talks and workshops on environmental issues and how your students can help. So those include some of the issues that Trisha was talking about, but also loads and loads of other um, topics. They can deliver sessions in person and online. If you want to have a look at their profile um, of our speakers, please go to our website. So that's greenpeace.org.uk slash volunteering slash Greenpeace Speakers. Or just go into any search engine that you use and search for Greenpeace Speakers, because we do have a wide range of fantastic speakers who are either like Trisha, a youth speaker, um, who are 18 to 25, or also um, our older speakers. We've got doctors, scientists, teachers, really incredible group of volunteers so please have a look on the website you can directly request a speaker talk as well so they can support you in the learning you're doing uh, they can talk about a whole range of issues that could be about the climate emergency it could focus on forest protection and why our forests are so important uh, looking at deforestation and the links to the food that we eat so for example if you are thinking about teaching around like a plant-based diet that could be a great way to introduce it and explain what the impacts are. We also have workshops around ocean sanctuaries, and those are really about why we need to have 30% of our oceans protected by 2030 and how we're pushing for a global treaty on that. It looks at like plastic pollution and how that impacts marine life. Um, so yeah, we also have a specific talk on plastic pollution if you prefer to take that angle or sustainable transport as well, which looks at how students can green their travel and what changes we need at a national uh, and global level. To support your learning, we've got a full suite of free educational resources. Uh, these you can just download uh, on the website. They're for seven to 18 year olds. Uh, they are developed by teachers for teachers. Um, so they are cross-curricular. They support your learning um, with your students on sustainability, the SDGs and global citizenship. They work really well for say a geography, citizenship or English lesson. 
all of our sessions, so the talks with our speakers, as well as these resources are very interactive and they're fully supported by activities, uh, which is nice because literally all you'll need to do is download them and they're ready to use straight away. So yeah, have a look at the website and you can also reach out to us at getactive.uk at greenpeace.org.uk if you want to just hear a bit more about what we can do or if you want to set something up. Um, and I just want to conclude by giving a massive thank you to Tricia for such a brilliant presentation. It was really, really inspiring. And I want to open the floor for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tricia. And thank you, Eleanor. As Eleanor just said, Tricia, your presentation was absolutely inspiring. So thank you so much. So a few questions have come into the chat. So if I can start with this question, Tricia. The question is, do you link up with the NUS Green Impact Project? So at university, are you involved in that as well? Or do you discuss strategies with them? Um, I believe that currently at my university, there are some people linked up with the NUS Green Impact Project. And I may have been involved in one project with them but currently it is not sort of one of the main um, sort of partnerships that's currently going on, if that makes any sense. Yes. But, there, but there is always, what I always think is partnerships with as many people, as many people in the organizations and is so important. Collaboration is so important. And, um, and it's, I know, I don't know what NUS is doing is really, really um, great. Yes. I can also um, add that from like a program level, like, yes, that's definitely something we're looking at. Um, so we're working in partnership with Unison, um, so who are also part of NUS, and they're doing an amazing green impact project. Um, so as part of that, we are supporting them with speakers. And I'm also going to one of their youth conferences soon. They're doing incredible work. But as Trisha said, so many groups are doing incredible work. Uh, and we're really keen to like support and help amplify where we can. So if you've got a suggestion for us, just get in touch. I'm really keen to hear about everything that that's out there. Excellent. Thank, thank you both for that answer. And yes, we absolutely agree. We're totally in favour of connecting and collaborating. Absolutely. So thank you. So another question, uh, Tricia, is how how do you respond with your fellow students? So the students at university who are not already um, sort of involved in Greenpeace and aren't heavily involved in environmental sustainability. So how do you respond to the so what? Or how do you respond to um, any of your fellow students who aren't as forward looking as you are? So I always think that one of the main reasons why people have the question so what is because they've seen the information and they just get so overwhelmed with it and they feel like there's nothing that can be done. They're bombarded with quite a quite a lot and they've just assessed it and they've gone, okay, you know, I don't think that I can do too much in my, in what I do. What I'm doing is not really relevant. But what I say to them is just look at what you are doing. Look at the fact that even simple changes that you can make in your life can cause other people, other people who also say, so what, to kind of think, oh, why are they doing that? Why have they changed what they're doing? And it kind of has sort of a ripple effect. So even just tiny things like that can make a massive difference. And I think people also underestimate the um, impact of banding together with other people and um, trying to convince politicians and policy makers to create a change because ultimately they're the people that you want to convince to be able to make the biggest difference. A lot of people feel overwhelmed because it's because they think they need to do so many different changes themselves. The onus is all on them. They have to do this, do that. Oh, I can't buy from this company. I have to make sure that um, I'm doing this all the time. And then when they slip up, it's like, oh, I'm, I give up. 
but I want people to remember that what's important is not necessarily what's done on an individual level. It's trying to change the whole public opinion and put pressure on people that really can make a difference. It really should be making it easier for us to be making the most sustainable decisions. Sorry if I went on a, on a bit of a tangent there. No, that's an excellent answer, Tricia. And I totally agree with everything that you said there. Exactly. It's about all of those things, isn't it? About individuals taking small and simple steps, but it's also about us using our voices and making sure that there are new policies for sustainable development. And everybody can see there are some very good links that have been placed into the chat, um, including a policy brief on education for sustainable development and best practice in the UK. So please, everybody, have a look at those links. So thank you very much, Tricia and Eleanor. And I'll now hand over to Mike. Thanks, Helen. Thanks, Eleanor and Tricia again. So what question will be, will be sitting with me for a long time. The what if, so what, and the what next. Brilliant presentation. Thank you so much. And to everyone so far this morning who has um, put their particular perspectives and experience around peace and peace education together and the connections we've been able to make. and thank you very much for inviting me. Um, this follows very much on from the work that Jeanette talked about this morning. So if you were in Jeanette's session this morning, this actually just in a very, in a nutshell, we'll put some, put a bit more flesh on the bones and give you a little bit more about our local context here. So uh, I want to talk about the Coventry Ambassador Japanese Peace Garden, which actually linked to a wider peace project with five Coventry primary schools. Um, who worked collaboratively on this project, which was actually one of the really lovely things about the project was a collaboration between schools, because we often find as schools, we come together for sporting events, which actually is in competition with each other. So it was really lovely to have a, an extended project over a, over a few years working together with other children. Um, just to give you the context of the, the project that we worked on, we're based in Coventry, which itself is a city of peace and reconciliation. So these themes are very important to us and our schools already. Um, and within that context, we've done a lot of work with Japanese education. We have links with schools in Japan across a number of our schools. Um, very much uh, an interest in Japanese culture and tradition, again, across, across a lot of our schools. Um, you can see some of the taiko drumming children. We've even taken children, primary school, over to Japan. Um, so that gives you the backdrop of why when we were invited to join a Cities of Peace project linked to no theatre, working with Between the Stones and the Japan Society, it really felt absolutely right for us because it felt everything was coming together in terms of our values as a city and our interests in, in Japanese education. And again, I'm sort of backtracking a little bit over what uh, Jeanette has already talked to you about. We had three strands to our project. Uh, we wanted our children to learn about peace and to write peace poems, which were then displayed on Tanzaku, um, and they were displayed in the cathedral in Coventry and in London. One of the really lovely parts of this element of the project was it gave our pupils a voice locally and nationally. So they were able to share their thoughts about peace in these very condensed poems, some of them haikus, but that were shared with a very wide audience. And I think the other nice thing that we really liked about this part of our project was um, we'd originally started off with an idea of some fancy tanzaku and we we're going to buy some fancy things. And actually then we went down the recycle route. So you can see here children of recycle bottles, to hang their poems on. So we felt it really then added a the whole aspect of sustainability. Um, so again, linking, linking a lot of themes all into one piece of work. And again, um, these Tanzaku peace poems were displayed in the Embassy of Japan, uh, which so nice to give the children a voice, particularly young children. Following on from the peace poems, we wanted to explore our own heritage as a city um, and the experience of people living in Coventry during World War II and how a city could be very much destroyed, but then people could come back and rebuild and actually build, build back in a peaceful way and build on the reconciliation. And this very much linked with our study of Hiroshima and the experience that the people in Hiroshima went through. So we were very fortunate to have a video conference with the, um, with the Peace Museum in Hiroshima. And our children were able to 
explore the themes of going through conflict and quite violent conflict, or very violent conflict, and then how people come, could come together from such loss and such tragedy and build, build peace, build reconciliation, build a new life. And children explore this through no theatre, which is something was a really unique opportunity to learn something very different to their own culture, to learn about no theatre and the traditions within that, and then to link that to something close to home, the um, bombing of Coventry in World War II, and then also to Hiroshima. What this led to was we were originally going in our project to design some miniature Karasansui gardens so John could look at peace gardens and, and look at how they're designed in Japan. But following on from the work that we did with Hiroshima and following on from the work that we looked at within Coventry, we felt our children really felt a connection between Coventry and Hiroshima. And they actually came together to design a garden that we that we entitled that the children entitled cities cities of peace or uh, sorry islands of peace I beg your pardon thinking about how people could be operators islands but then come together through peace and in the diagram you can see here uh, uh, if you can see it clearly num number 10 they're two separate islands and they're joined by number six by broken bridge which represented peace bringing separate parties together but the bridge is broken and the children really felt that represented peace being something quite difficult to attain. It wasn't just a smooth journey. Within the garden that the children designed, we were really lucky because we were then given a space in the War Memorial Park in Coventry. And I know this project, probably if you're listening, sounds absolutely huge. And how could anybody possibly recreate this? But this was really, we were just five ordinary primary schools and we just approached our local large municipal park and said, we've got an idea, have you got space? Um, and an absolutely huge park and the, the park staff were really keen to engage with the children and engage to create this, this peace garden that would be there for everybody to use. And so I think it's something that could be replicated in, in other places. Um, you'll come on to see what the garden looks like, but this was a space, the space of land that we started with, which actually then gets completely transformed through the children's work and through their exploration. Um, I guess just from a practical point of view, it did require funding. So whilst I'm talking about it could be replicated, we were very lucky that we did receive very generous funding from a number of organisations. We, our project was very much pupil focused, and I've talked about pupil voice through the poetry, pupil voice through the dark drama, within the designing of the Peace Garden, the Japanese Peace Garden, we wanted it to be led by children first and foremost, which is why we had a pupil management committee who really were responsible for the key decisions in shaping this project. We wanted it to be their project and put it in their hands. Um, I'm gonna very quickly go through this bit, but one aspect that we really did like about the project, as well as them having the opportunity to think about peace, creating a peaceful space for the wider community, it gave them opportunity to think about careers and uh, in a very practical way so the children were very much involved in the creation of this garden and, and as I flashed through some of these photos these are the pupils from primary schools digging the foundations working with the construction companies working with project managers actually putting cement down so it was quite unique in the, the fact that the children not only had the inspiration for the garden and the design for the garden, but they actually were there digging it. And you can see this, this area taking shape, even with the bricklaying. Um, so I'll go through some of these fairly quickly. Down to uh, the, working with the graphics arts designer, creating the interpretation board so that people coming to visit their garden would have an understanding of what it meant to them. Um, and actually the garden, building the garden itself was a peaceful process because the children were in nature they spent a long time working. You can see this, the pebble here representing the water in the garden. Children enjoyed that tactile element. They also really enjoyed the idea of working with nature. So the opportunity to plant and to have a sustainable area, which was really gave the children a lot of pleasure, a lot of pleasure working together on this. Um, and you can see the garden gradually begin, began to take shape for the children. And then we were lucky enough to get some additional funding. So we decided to then on top of the, well, next to the garden, sorry, not on top of it, adjacent to the garden, build a cherry grove, again, creating another peaceful space. So we, we then brought all of these elements together, the garden, I'm sorry, I'm really gonna speak quickly, I appreciate my time's run out, sorry. Um, 
the children then brought this all together to Japan Arts Festival, where we were lucky enough to host it at Coventry Cathedral. So the children you can see here, children performing the No Theatre, the Dean presenting the Cross of Nails from Coventry City to Hiroshima, and then the official opening of the garden for the public with the ambassador from the Embassy of Japan. And so it's something really that we really felt celebrated children, their work in peace and the wider project. I think I'm completely out of time there, Mike. <laughs> no, Rebecca, thank you so much. It's such a, I mean, we could spend an, an hour on each of these wonderful showcases. Um, thanks. What's a pragmatic um, example of a connection, such a strong connection with many different facets and layers to it? And something you said at the beginning really struck me um, about, you just said it in passing, about the, you know, the children's work. Oh, it was just displayed in the Japanese embassy. I mean, for most children in the country, it's where's your work displayed? Or oh, it's in the year three corridor. But for you, it's in the Japanese embassy. Absolutely brilliant work. Thank you so much for sharing it with us. Um, Anne, are we going to introduce our next showcase? Thanks, Rebecca. Our next um, showcase is from Hockerall College. Shamala and Fernando will talk us through some of the work that they've been doing. Anne, thank you so much for this wonderful, wonderful opportunity. I was really struck by the previous speaker, um, you know, talking about the power of what students can do. I've been a teacher at Hockerall College for a very, very long time in Bishop Stortford. And we are at that precise midpoint between Cambridge and London and um, for people who don't know the area. And it's, it's a very, you know, it's a very special school. It's in many ways an international school. We draw students from all over the world. It's also a state boarding school just to provide some context. And what we're, I think, most proud of is what our students are able to do when we give them the opportunities to flourish. And so here next to me this afternoon is Fernando Ajayo Damas, um, who is a product of Hockerall Anglo-European College, um, who was um, our house captain um, in senior boys boarding, and he was also our head of Model United Nations. Um, Fernando is able to do this talk perfectly in English, as you will hear. However, he could also very easily and equally um, slip into Spanish, French or German, um, if you would find that that is, is more helpful. Um, Fernando has been at the college um, since he finished university, currently teaching theory of knowledge, um, which is a course in um, epistemology in the IB um, International Baccalaureate Diploma Program. He's also a boarding house tutor. Fernando started working with us in partnership, actually, before he rejoined the college in 2017, when we began um, the process of decolonizing our curriculum through the Creativity, Activity, Service and Enrichment Program, which uh, the acronym for which is the CASE curriculum. This really is about bringing aspiration to action through the curriculum, and Fernando is going to be talking through that. At this point, I'm going to be walking away, but just thanking Fernando publicly for the amazing work that he has done in assisting us in the review and redesign of our case programme. His input has been invaluable, as you will see. And Fernando is also available should any schools need his help going forward um, with a fresh pair of eyes um, to give that insight. Fernando, over to you. Thank you so much. Um, yes, thank you. It's such an honour to be here to be able to speak to you. Um, I must say, just to begin, is, is that one of, the, one of my main interests in education and the reason why I decided to return to this really special college, which is Hokro, is for teachers like Shamila. Even though I never chose literature at a high level and she wasn't ever able to teach me, which was a big regret that I have. But in any case, today I really wanted to give some context before getting into explaining the case curriculum as to where Hokro was, where it's been and where it's heading. Um, so uh, this is our mission statement, and you will notice the emphasis on, on, global, on, on global education here. And here at Hocker, what we try to do is, is develop inquiry knowledgeable and responsible global citizens through academic excellence. In the past 42 years, uh, Hocker has gone from being a local school to then becoming a European college and now heading towards being a fully global and decolonized school. Uh, although it was early established in 1850 as a teacher training college when it reopened in 1980s it was a co-educational boarding school but the, and then in the year 1998 uh, this proved to be a defining year so we introduced the international baccalaureate Hockerall became an anglo-european college it attracted students from all, all over europe including myself and some of my family members um, we started to teach music history and geography bilingually which was uh, the first school to do this nationally um, 
and in addition to this, establish cultural links with schools all over Europe to offering language exchanges for students. So as you can see, in, Hockler enjoys a rich and varied heritage and testament to this is an institution that is constantly pursuing innovation. And in the last couple of years, we're once again at another juncture point. Um, our school, which devotes itself to developing global citizens, has recently felt, and this includes its current students, teachers, and alumni, that we needed to rethink exactly what we meant by global education. Being part of a UNESCO Associated Schools net Network is a defining aspect of what Hockle is today, and most importantly, the path it wants to follow in the coming years. So we want to build an education at Hockerall that is founded on international understanding, peace, intercultural dialogue, sustainable development goals and quality in education and practice. Um, so what I want to introduce to you today is this new innovative subject that we've introduced for pupils between the ages of 14 and 16, uh, called as Shamila mentioned, Creativity, Activity, Service and Enrichment, or CASE for short. The CASE curriculum is answering to the current demand by students and people all over the world for an education that fosters, that fosters cultural diversity, that it's interdisciplinary and that it's problem based. Um, through our case units, which I'll explain now, we look at issues such as reflexivity, right? We want our students to be reflexive. We want individuals that are able to reflect on their experiences, that are learning to better understand how they learn, the challenges they face. And these are students that are self-aware, they're self-critical, they work together, they work individually, and they're honest and critical about themselves too. They are motivated to improve. One of the examples of one of the units we look at is Great Debates of Today, where students are encouraged to look at any subject in periodicals or newspapers, prepare themselves for a Westminster-style debate, and they need to be able to anticipate counter-arguments, they need to be able to adapt during the debate if things go wrong, you need to be able to um, do well and to deal with feedback from other speakers, and most importantly, creating a culture of debate which is educational and not something that is to be won, but something that is to be understood. And, to, and the only winning is to learn from someone else. Um, we also want to create, create disruptive thinkers. This is something I'm particularly, um, particularly passionate about. We want, to, we want students that are not just memory banks, but that are, have the intellectual tools to challenge the paradigms of today. So throughout the course, such as in, the, in this uh, unit, Environment and Crisis, we want them to deal with contemporary issues and to come up with solutions, not just to sit in the sidelines. So in this unit, for instance, we give the opportunity for students to look at the environment at a local, global or national stage. Um, so, for instance, they could be elaborating a policy brief to the IPCC on any climate issue they wish, or they could research a greenwash advertising campaign from a firm and remake it to really represent what their environmental practice or my practice in this case is. And we also give them the, the opportunity to look at a local environmental issue, to organise a service event and to actually get their hands dirty, whether it's in school or in Bishop Saltford to actually create some serious change. Uh, we're equally interested, Hockerall is all about, it's an Anglo-European school, but as we say, we want to take a global leap and we're interested in world belief systems. We thought that if there wasn't a better opportunity to look at ethics than to look at not the conventional majoritarian religions, but to get students to think about those religions which aren't talked about, whether it's an indigenous belief systems, whether it's ancient religions that are not looked at today, and really, this was an idea also to get their hands dirty in bringing in artistic and creativity. So they, in this unit, what we get them to do is to build a model or an effigy or a relic of this religion that they've researched with recycled materials. So that they're not just constantly just researching and presenting, but actually creating something um, that we can then display. Uh, this unit, Arts into Actions unit, once again, we're trying to bring arts, politics, current affairs, and the sustainable development goals. So they're taking, they're, they're reflecting on how they consume media, how they consume the arts today. And then they're trying to come up with their own production, whether it's in arts or music or drama and link it to a sustainable development goal. So the idea is of giving arts a purpose and that students are using their creative means for this. Um, we then look at science in the world, just to give a, a, a brief overlook about it. Science in the world, the scientific method, the role we've all seen during the COVID-19 pandemic and during the vaccination program, how scientific method and scientific rigor have been called into question. We want students to teach their fellow students about the importance of this. Uh, and finally, I think most important, it's about lifelong learning. So the idea that we're creating learners for the future, people are constantly reflecting on the progress. And what they do here is they, this is the final project where they, they create their own advocacy campaign 
as year 11 students, bringing everything together and finally creating some proper impact. Um, and yes, this is a brief overview of what our, what the case curriculum is about. Uh, if you've got any questions, of course, we'll be very happy to answer them via email. Hopefully this presentation can be shared. We've got a link to our curriculum in one of these slides. Um, yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity. Absolutely brilliant to hear what I think, sadly, is the exception rather than the rule in education at the moment, but to foster disruptive thinkers, not memory boxes and the rich and diverse way you do that. It was always brilliant to see um, what, you know, a student you've taught, Shamila, and what happens to them, the value you've added, and then in, in turn, the connection between the two of you and the value you then add to each other. Fernando, thank you so much. La Escuela Primaria José Mendoza García del municipio de Trinidad, asociada de la UNESCO por más de 20 años, defiende varios proyectos institucionales. Uno de ellos, y es el que más relación guarda con la historia de nuestra localidad, es el proyecto Tradiciones, donde se resalta el decursar de nuestros antepasados a lo largo de la historia de nuestra villa, costumbres, bailes y idiosincrasia. Varios proyectos se asocian al mismo, y es el caso de las tonadas trinitarias, resaltando su valor patrimonial. No se cuenta con una fecha exacta de su fundación, por lo que han existido muchas teorías y argumentos al respecto, colocando sus orígenes en el Valle de los Ingenios alrededor de 1840 y otros le dan un carácter más urbano por los temas más comunes de sus textos. Las Tonadas Trinitarias es una manifestación musical afrocubana originaria del pueblo de Trinidad de Cuba. Fue aquí donde las prácticas musicales locales de los esclavos africanos y sus descendientes, más peninsulares y criollos blancos, se mezclaron, produciendo un ambiente propicio para la creación de formas musicales criollas, siendo un vivo ejemplo de la transculturación acontecida en toda Cuba. Esta tradición es además complementada con técnicas artesanales tradicionales en la fabricación de sus tambores característicos, contando entre sus integrantes con el único portador conocedor de las técnicas de su fabricación. Para este proyecto institucional hemos contado con el apoyo del grupo musical Tonadas Trinitarias, que se presentan en el Centro Cultural de Artex, Palenque de los Congos Reales. Ellos, con su toque distintivo, han logrado la empatía de los niños de nuestra escuela, inculcándoles el amor por este género, manteniendo así viva la tradición en las nuevas generaciones. Todo el trabajo de cantación de pioneros interesados y con potencialidades se ha visto materializado en encuentros culturales desarrollados en nuestro centro, acto de inicio de curso escolar y el taller de intercambio y gestiones de proyectos de desarrollo Trinidad y el Valle de los Ingenios. enjoyed that as much as um, I did. Um, the next person we've got up to present their work is Vera Delari from Greece. Welcome Vera. Good afternoon everyone. Uh, good afternoon from Athens and uh, thank you so much for the invitation and for the opportunity to present the work of our network which consists of 250 schools. Uh, I'm pleased to see that many of our teachers have registered for the event and the workshops, so I take the opportunity to talk about the aim of our work, which is no other than to promote the humanistic vision of UNESCO, the ideals and values, as well as to raise awareness and call for action. Uh, until now, we have seen and heard wonderful ideas and projects uh, on connecting for peace, and Mrs. Sogura's speech was so touching but shocking as well. Could you now please start the video for me?
Okay, thank you. Uh, well, uh, our school's work is built on the goal to construct the defenses of peace in the mind, in the minds of children and young people. Through projects on ESD and global citizenship, the great importance of living in peaceful world and society is emphasized. Having that in mind, we contributed to the recent UNESCO's report, the new social contract for education, through consultations in focus group discussions for teachers, students, and parents. As mentioned in this report, we need to build capabilities that make students autonomous and ethical thinkers and doers. Uh, in the video, you have seen some highlights of our school activities under the pillar learning to live together. And there are some more in the other pillars, but time was limited. It is important that our teachers have brought UNESCO's values and priorities into other projects and networks, Erasmus Plus, Sitwini, and have established cooperation with schools all over the world. The challenge is to be active and to do things in order to create an environment of security, friendship, and solidarity among young people in periods of peace. In this framework, the voices of our students were brought at global level through their participation in UNESCO conferences like the Global Students Forum, international campaigns such as Trash Hack or UNESCO's video like the one for COP26, where our student called participants to join forces to learn for our planet so that we can act for our planet. Moreover, it is important, and it was mentioned earlier from another speaker, to make students understand that peace can also be built within, within us by adopting techniques of dialogue and active listening. The following project was designed in this direction. In uh, this school, if students felt that they were not able to resolve a dispute, they asked the mediation school committee to intervene. This committee consisted of four students chosen for their consensual character. The conclusion was behavioral agreements. Many pro uh, projects focus on SDGs, especially 16 and 17, from kindergarten to senior high school. Students participated in activities concluded that the strength to maintain peace is in people's hands. In some other schools, touched by the refugee crisis and the recent war, students took initiatives to raise awareness in the community. They formed the sign of peace in a circle as a clear message against violence and war, and they organized days of solidarity, friendship, and peace with the participation of refugee students. Furthermore, school projects on cultural heritage were implemented. Our school participated, one of our schools participated in the pilot UNESCO EU project on teaching and learning in heritage at school-based education. This is, uh, this photo is from a workshop in ancient Olivia for teachers. And that reminds me the tree we were talking in the beginning, we UNESCO streets. Culture and education going hand by hand contribute to the maintenance of peace. The different cultures form a multicultural mosaic and students through various activities came to the conclusion that when people are united, the world becomes a wonderful place. Digital stories, fairy tales of diversity and artwork, gaming and coding activities were used as well in many projects. Exploring the approach of active learning and project-based learning, students were acti actively engaged in order to enhance their skills of inquiry and debate and to be prepared for future challenges in the real world. An interesting activity is that students in a pre-primary school were asked to create a bridge using building blocks. Then they crossed this bridge while looking after each other. They understood that by helping and supporting each other and respecting their needs, a safe environment can be created. To sum up, it was proved in numerous ways through all the projects that peace can prevail and that education roles in reaching this goal is defining. Dear colleagues, thank you for your attention and I'm, I'm looking forward to our further cooperation. Thank you so much.
Thank you so much, Vera, and also for being to the second on your timing. Extremely good. Thank, Thank you so you. much. I think what strikes me from you, you said earlier in your presentation, the strength to maintain peace is is found in people's hearts. That to me was the core of, of, of what you said in your presentation across all age groups. Thank you so much for your time. Anne. Thank you very much, Vera. And I'm sorry I muted myself and cut off your video sound. I'm don't really worry, don't worry. The image is very powerful, so it's okay. <laughs> I think the message was sent. Thank you so much. Um, I'd now like to welcome Marga Jata, who will be doing a presentation shortly. I would like to talk about our different from others uh, examples you, you had. Uh, my name is Małgorzata Herwig. I'm the Polish ASP.NET National Coordinator. Uh, for, for us, we are meeting during a very difficult time for the international community linked to UNESCO. As James uh, Bridge reminded, UNESCO's uh, goal is to build peace in minds of people. Our cooperation with Anne Beatty and uh, Vera uh, Dilari from Greece began with uh, the ASP.NET meeting in Kazan in Russia. Uh, all the more, uh, the present situ situation is very sad for me. We no longer have contact with ASP.NET in Russia and the Polish ASP.NET is currently focusing its activity on helping Ukraine and millions of refugees especially children uh, who ended up in our schools. The Russians, uh, Russian invasion took place on February 24th. Four days later, one of our schools near Warsaw accepted about uh, 200 young refugees. In total, almost 4 million Ukrainians, mainly women and children, crossed the Polish border. Many of them already returned home, others went, went to different countries, but for now uh, about 30% declared they want to stay in Poland forever. Uh, this is uh, where the network like ASP.NET is very helpful. We organized two online meetings, we shared materials received from UNESCO and ASP.NET during the meeting in March 17th. Uh, uh, of the representatives of SPNET from countries most affected by uh, the exodus uh, from Ukraine, Poland, Hungary, uh, Slovakia, Romania, Moldova, and Germany. Uh, the schools uh, exchanged information and developed ideas, as well as materials regarding reception of refugees. For years, some of our schools have been conducting intercultural activities for students related to the presence of refugees or emigrants, which have now turned out to be invaluable. The schools also shared their experience. For example, they recommended the elimination of bells signaling the beginning of lessons, which could uh, resemble for the howling of anti uh, aircraft sirens. Schools spontaneously organized anti-war demonstration and collection of gifts for refugees. Those located near the border with Ukraine organized transport of things necessary for refugees and transports of people from the border. In schools where Ukrainian children were present, school communities brought their families from Ukraine to their own homes. But the subject of peace in Poland, a country so affected by war in the past, is always present. Maybe that is why Polish ASP.NET was uh, invited to two pilot editions of the International Youth Competition in, in the Service of Peace, organized by uh, France Television and UNESCO, in cooperation with UNESCO national committees. In the first edition, it was student, students from Lebanon who experienced war. They were the ones who created the most powerful works. When the second edition was announced in 2021, an almost prophetic film entitled Have You Been at War, Son? was made by a 
Ukrainian high school student from Warsaw. The finals of the competition took place during the war. Her compatriots and friends now have to fight. The second uh, competition in which Polish students took part in with great success was also the French film uh, competition entitled When Sound Creates Image, organized as a part of the UNESCO Sound Week. The Grand Prix was won by a student from high school in Lublin, Poland, for the film entitled Mist. It refers to the situation of refugees and the fear they experience. But I want to end my presentation with another film entitled Colors of Hope, made by teachers and children from a kindergarten in Warsaw. This film won the jury's special prize in the same competition. It beautifully shows the values promoted by UNESCO, which are cultivated and a daily basis, uh, on a daily basis uh, in the ASPNet. Thank you for attention. I hope you enjoy the film. Thank you very much. What a beautiful film. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Margaret Jossa. Amazing. I mean, I'm not sure whether it was a, um, one of the slides at the beginning about the, the idea that um, it just takes one candle um, to illuminate any amount of darkness. And I guess from your perspective, you're closer to darkness than, than many of us. And Therefore, the candle that you are shining um, is more illuminating. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Welcome, Lamin. Um, Lamin is here today to represent uh, UNESCO ASPNet in the Gambia. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, um, Betty, and thank you, um, the UK government um, and everyone who is present here. I'm really thrilled to be part of uh, this conference. So I am um, the ASP.NET National Coordinator um, in the Gambia, um, but I am presenting um, to you our concept and ideas about ASP.NET and what we have been doing over the years. So virtually that's uh, what you can see online, that's me. Um, um, you can see I love the sea. So um, this morning, I think I shared a video um, about the beach um, this morning in our WhatsApp group. So um, now you may want to know um, that we in the Gambia, we work closely, ASPNet and the, uh, the National Federation of UNESCO clubs. We work closely together, uh, so much so that um, sometimes it's difficult to tell um, who is who. So um, that's a group of young people um, from both the UNESCO club and the ASPNet, you know, um, uh, um, visiting the UNESCO quarter, um, regional headquarters in the Dakar. Um, in our ASPNet um, network, 
we have um, altogether 20 schools. Formerly, it used to be um, 21, um, but um, some of the schools are no longer existing. So um, therefore, this is the list of schools in our network. We have senior secondary school 12, um, upper basic school five, and lower basic school three. Um, now, I want to start with the saying, um, since uh, a lot of us work in the area of peace building and peace maintenance, especially given the UNESCO uh, philosophy about building peace in the minds of men. And this is a Mandinka proverb, um, which says, Faran in Jambakatamo, Sinyo Kubuka, Sinyo Kar. Basically, what it means is that um, people who are neighbors really have to look out for each other. Um, it, it's the story about two types of uh, shrubs in the forest. You know, if something bad is happening to the other and the other is not looking out for that, um, what is befalling the, the companion shrub, um, eventually, if something happens to, it can happen to both of them. So if we translate that into one of the English sayings is that a friend in need is a friend indeed. Um, and now the logic of this saying is for the occupiers of the earth to live in a symbiotic existence, meaning humans, animals, both terrestrial and aquatic, and as well as the forest. We need to look out for each other um, on earth. But basically, as the chief actors on earth, we human beings really have to watch our action to make sure that it doesn't destroy um, the um, symbiotic existence that we have with both human, um, 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 both animals and the forest, that is the uh, trees. Um, I say this because whatever we do to the earth comes back to us. And generally, when we take a look at what we do at the National Commission for UNESCO with our ASP.NET, um, we have had a lot of engagement in terms of um, some participation programs that we organize. We have this one called Promotion of Youth and Student Engagement in the celebration of the, the 20th anniversary of the UNESCO Slave Food Project. Now, that is the TST, Transatlantic Slave Trade. Um, during the, and also we have the Youth Students Engagement to Foster Global Citizenship, Sustainable Development Initiatives, and Peace Building in the Gambia as well as uh, water for sustainable livelihoods, promoting, um, promoting uh, water resources management in the SPNet schools and UNESCO clubs. We also have had uh, women and youth engagement through disaster risk management for a sustainable um, climate action. Now, I just want to, among all this, I just want to highlight on the issue of the transatlantic slave trade. Um, which um, kind of aligns with the UNESCO's uh, anniversary of the uh, Slave Root Project. Now, during the time that we were um, um, implementing this program, um, you may want to know, um, because outwardly, um, slavery will kind of um, um, deal with um, discrimination at the larger scale, but even within our communities, we have um, some conflict, you know, or if you like, you know, um, um, inhibiting conflicts that can exist among ethnic ethnicities, you know, in terms of political um, um, appointments or in terms of even political um, canvassing for positions, you know. So in our context, we really have to translate, you know, what happens at the world stage in terms of discrimination, in terms of racism, you know, but also within our community in terms of ethnic you know, um, biases, you know, so much so that we have to talk about this, make radio programs to make sure that people are aware that they don't need to um, kind of discriminate each other in terms of their religion, in terms of gender, in terms of um, their sex uh, and other um, alignments, you know. So we have had a lot of radio programs and uh, we were able to have uh, theatrical performances, you know, where students came up uh, with some performances that were inspired by the Amazing Grace um, video. Um, we also have had discussions uh, with historians and also history teachers in the schools. There was also the observance of the International Peace uh, Day, September 24th, which had um, some music and sports and the promotion of peace and nonviolence. 
Now, when it comes to um, the youth engagement to foster global citizenship, you know, um, and sustainable development initiative in the Gambia, um, what we have done is to kind of collaborate um, with um, organizations such as UNFPA, you know, and also Peace Ambassadors of the Gambia, because we know that uh, comparatively, they have some advantages when it comes to um, talking about um, reproductive health, as well as in terms of peace building. The Peace Ambassadors have been in that field for a long time. So we have to collaborate with them to make sure that our students and also some of the UNESCO club members, you know, would have to learn um, uh, peace building uh, initiatives and also um, uh, take up peace education as their fields of interest. And what is beautiful about this is that um, people who have graduated from our ASP.NET um, schools will kind of transit because UNESCO clubs are both community-based and also um, um, com community-based and school-based. So we, we, we had to, we, they, they share their interest when they leave school with uh, UNESCO clubs. So the concepts of GSGZ were introduced to them and uh, when we look at uh, Water for Sustainable Livelihood, this was promoted in our um, UNESCO clubs um, as well as ASP.NET schools. You know, we raised their awareness of teachers, students in the utilization and management of water, developed training manual on water education, trained teachers on innovation such as development of prototypes on water treatments, recycling and purification of household usage, we also train students to prepare prototypes that help them in the utilization of water with a great emphasis on girls. Now, some of our schools, especially this particular school is in an area where the uh, river water is very fresh. So sometimes the locals will go to the, um, to the river, you know, to fetch water and uh, they utilize this. Now, if they kind of use the water straight away from the river, um, they can, it can contaminate. Um, so we uh, treating, asking students to learn how to treat, you know, contaminated water was very essential. And you can see um, the facilitator here, you know, uh, trying to help the students on how to build the prototype. But as well, they were taught how to purify um, water, you know, and uh, this was very, uh, very useful for the students. Um, here you can see the teachers, you know, who were also um, put up, who were also on the training and they learned how to, um, to purify water uh, for water conservation. They also, um, now, when it comes to climate change, um, like I said, you know, our relationship with our environment is supposed to be such that we don't destroy it, but we use it in a judicious manner, judicious way, you know, so much so that it will become sustainable and uh, the generations that will come after us will be able to utilize and benefit from the forest resources. So therefore we had to engage, you know, our communities and also our students in issues um, related to sustainable climate action um, through disaster risk management. So um, here, our different uh, um, climate uh, change related policies, you know, were kind of uh, brought out in our awareness raising as well as the SDG six, which had to do with water and sanitation. We had to sensitize um, our communities on this, how to use them. And in our sensitization, we had to kind of um, uh, pay much emphasis to the participation of women and youth on early warning system between, uh, for disaster preparedness and uh, emergencies and resilience, innovative agricultural practices. We also embark on cleanup exercise and reforestation um, in our communities. We train youth on alternative use of um, energy. You know that here people use um, the forest a lot when it comes to their cooking. People go to the forest to um, fetch firewood and uh, they use it for their cooking. So uh, if you can teach them, you know, sustainable um, alternative means of making, you know, um, um, fuel wood for their cooking, it was very, very important. And energy saving um, stove, we are also, they were taught how to make them and also how to use the briquettes, you know, which can be um, used when we use these uh, drop leaves from trees, dried leaves, and also groundnut husks, you know, to kind of make uh, briquettes for their charcoal instead of cutting the forest and burning charcoal from there. So these were very, very relevant um, 
uh, initiatives that we have engaged our um, community of students in. Now here, um, we actually um, took time, you know, to go to our schools and plant trees with them and encourage them to, to not only plant trees, but to grow them because planting, um, you just put it in the ground, but growing them means nurturing them to maturity so that they can escape from whatever um, uh, can harm them. So we encourage our schools, you know, to, to grow trees. And what um, this has done was to able to tell them that you can, the trees that you plant, you can benefit from them. Um, you can benefit uh, from trees by bringing fruit trees, build, uh, uh, planting fruit trees, growing them. But you can also do wooded trees at the point where when you need to construct um, for your school, you can use these trees you know, to cut them for your timber instead of going into the forest or trying to buy timber that can be very expensive. So we ask them to kind of grow a mini forest within their school garden or farms, you know, so much so that it will be bought for um, fruit trees like cashew nuts, which is a commercial uh, cast tree now. It's a commercial tree in the Gambia where you can gain a lot of funds from. And you can also uh, plant trees such as the mahogany and the malina, which when they mature, you can cut them in a sustainable way and use the wood for the school building project. So Do you can okay. see- Lamin, I'm really sorry, but we've absolutely run out of time because we've got the next speaker. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Um, it's okay, thank it, you. Thank we've, you. we've run over just ever so slightly. Thank you for such a wonderful presentation. Thank you, Lamin. Thank you, um, thank you. It's been so interesting. And we will share all the slides with people um, who are attending the conference. Thank you so much. I am honored and humbled, thank you. Welcome now. I'd like to present Sinead, um, who is from the Anglo-European School in so Over to you, Sinead. Hello, everybody. Uh, it's been really wonderful to listen to everyone's presentations. I'm from the Anglo-European School, which is based just outside London in Essex. And um, just, I'll just take a few minutes to share with you our programme. Just to sum this up, we are a normal school. We are a comprehensive school. We're a state school. We take every different type of student you can imagine from all different walks of life. Uh, we particularly focus on languages at our school. And what we're very passionate about is making sure that our students can go abroad all the time, every year, as much as possible, so that they be can become completely fluent in their language, but also that they can experience the culture and the joy of being away. Now, uh, you will notice the massive amount of photos here of our students. They are from all over the world. Uh, maybe in the break, I can leave it up and you can guess which country they're in. But of course, this is all from pre-COVID times. Now, um, we used to go to China, Japan, South Africa and Lesotho, to Russia. We went to just before the COVID um, situation really took off in 2020. And we also go to France, Spain, Germany, Italy, all on exchange visits. And we really believe that this is the UNESCO mission, that we're going out and we're meeting people and sharing all the information that we have with each other and that we become better as a result. This is what we plan to run in our visits programme next year because we have had a bridging time uh, due to COVID. We've run many residential visits this year but we've kept them in the United Kingdom but we are working really hard at the moment and we are very, very positive about ensuring that our exchange program and uh, residentials program will be running again next year. If anyone would like to contact me, then please do about how we do that in a completely, like I say, a state school, a comprehensive school. Um, we have nearly every member of staff on these visits programs going abroad or hosting, etc. Uh, please do contact me because we have a model that can be reproduced in other schools and we are more than happy to support other schools with um, the costing elements, the risk assessment elements and all the other many, many things that have to be taken into consideration, especially when we think about these steps going forward. Um, so uh, I will just leave you there because I want you to go and enjoy your break. And um, as I say, I'll be very happy to hear from any of you and very interested in all the projects that you're doing as well. So thank you very, very much. 
wonderful to hear what again is is the exception rather than the rule that should be the rule for secondary education absolutely amazing the work you do and the experience the broad experience you give to your students thank you once again for your time and to all the showcase presenters um, what a tapestry what a rich woven cloth of peace manifested practically in the minds and in the hands of children across the world thank you so much for sharing me great pleasure to introduce Peter Ratchleff as our keynote speaker for this session. So I met Peter on a very cold day in October 2018. I was on a fascinating restorative justice tour of St Paul and Peter was our tour guide. I was immediately impressed by Peter's breadth and depth of knowledge and I learned a great deal that day and much of the tour was outside and as I was very cold indeed, which is hard to imagine now, <laughs> I was extremely relieved when we reached the Eastside Freedom Library. And when we went indoors, I was delighted, but not only because I warmed my fingers and toes, but also because the library was such a wonderful, welcoming place and it warmed my heart and my soul. And I have many fond memories of the Eastside Freedom Library. And here's one of the photographs I took that day. So it's a great pleasure that I welcome Peter to speak to us now. Helen, thank you very much for that kind introduction. Um, it's such a delight to see you again uh, and to know that something we did has opened additional doors. Um, and I'm honored uh, to have been invited and to have the opportunity uh, to talk with people as I'm seeing from all over the world. Um, you know, we're probably all in a position now of trying to figure out what have we learned during the pandemic that we want to continue to do rather than return to something that unfortunately is called normal. And Zoom has provided us with the ability to have conversations with each other in real time, uh, which is something we do not want to lose here at the Eastside Freedom Library in St. Paul, Minnesota, um, and something that we want to figure out how to make more interactive and how to build on. Um, even as we try to progress beyond uh, this crisis that, that we are in. So I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you uh, I'm also going to be part of the closing panel, so I hope that we get to do some uh, questions and conversation. And I certainly want to be available to you uh, via email, uh, via Zoom. Um, I encourage you to look at our website, uh, www.eastsidefreedomlibrary.org. Um, and uh, you can reach me at Peter at eastsidefreedomlibrary.org. So nothing suspicious, nothing tricky about any of those forms of communication. Um, we are uh, this month celebrating our eighth anniversary uh, as an organization and an institution. Um, I am uh, a labor historian uh, by training and trade. Um, I came into the field of labor history in the 1970s at a time when the field was being, as we said at the time, undergoing a paradigm shift. And the paradigm shift was from focusing on uh, unions as the heart of labor history and economics uh, and collective bargaining as a way of focusing uh, on unions uh, to shifting to a social history of working people. Uh, as the purview of, of labor history. And this meant that I became very interested in both immigration history and African-American history. And the East Side Freedom Library really shows those uh, focal points, shows sort of tries to situate ourselves at intersections 
intersections between immigrants and the labor movement, intersections between workers of color and white workers, uh, intersections between education and entertainment um, as ways of bringing people together and bringing stories, experiences, and perspectives that have been marginalized, uh, pushed to the shadows and the corners, to bringing them into the center uh, of our awareness and interest. So we're located in uh, St. Paul, Minnesota's most diverse and most economically challenged uh, neighborhood. Um, we are very much uh, carrying the consequences of uh, neoliberal globalization. Uh, this is an area that, of course, like most of the United States, uh, was once indigenous land. Uh, here, the predominant community was Dakota, and there were seven distinct communities of Dakota people. Uh, they were ethnically cleansed, uh, driven out, in the 1830s, 1840s, leading to a war uh, between the United States and the Dakota people during the American Civil War um, in the early 1860s. And this land was then made available for European settlers. Um, as a recovering academic, I will just mention parenthetically that um, my way of thinking has been rattled and sort of knocked apart and put back together uh, by my recent reading of Mahmoud Mamdani's uh, Neither Native Nor Settler. Uh, I cannot recommend any book as much as I would recommend Professor Mamdani's book. Uh, and we have tried to come to grips at the Eastside Freedom Library with the layers of history here beginning with the Dakota people who are not only part of our past, but are also part of our present. People from that community are still here. And as we engage more deeply with them, we also understand the ways that they are part of our future, that their understanding of ways of engaging with uh, the environment, uh, their ways of um, dealing with issues of gender and gender uh, variety, non-normativity, um, are all things that we can learn a great deal from. Beginning in the 1840s, uh, immigrants from Northern and Western Europe, particularly Sweden, Germany, and Ireland, uh, began to settle in this part of St. Paul. Um, they then became the base for a workforce for blue collar manufacturing and, uh, and building railroads and transportation. Uh, we are situated on the Mississippi River uh, and transportation has been a very important part uh, of the development of the St. Paul economy. Um, in the early 20th century, uh, immigrants from Southern, Central and Eastern Europe would arrive, particularly Italians, Serbs, Slovenes, um, and then in the era of World War I, immigrants from Mexico. Uh, and uh, they became part of a cohesive working class in this part of St. Paul that was utterly uh, torn apart by global neoliberalism. Uh, we lost over 15,000 unionized blue collar jobs in the 1990s and early 2000s. And uh, many European descended or so-called white people uh, moved away, property values plummeted, uh, uh, government interest in this part of the city declined. Um, and this, those same macroeconomic forces were transforming the lives of people in Southeast Asia, East Africa, and Central America, pushing them to emigrate. Many of them came here 
Um, so in an area that was once almost 100% European descended, where now more than 40% Asian and Asian American, predominantly Hmong and Karen, um, there is a large East African, uh, actually set of East African communities, uh, Eritrean, Oromo, Amhara, Somali, uh, and there is a growing Central American community, both Mexican and Salvadoran. So we live, my partner, Beth Cleary, who was a theater professor and theater maker, uh, Beth and I live in this neighborhood and uh, we experienced these changes and realized that uh, the newcomers were not being welcomed uh, by the European descended people who had lived here for generations. Um, and the deeper we dug, the more we realized that many of the newcomers were also uh, living in silos and not interacting much with each other. And so we wanted to create a space where people would share their stories with each other, where they would feel safe uh, to tell their stories, um, because of Beth's work in theater and the arts, uh, we really felt that there were many ways uh, that people might tell their stories. So there could be poetry, music, dance, theater, visual art, music. Um, and we wanted to create a space where all of those means uh, could be leveraged by our neighbors um, that we with some experience, or as we say in the US, uh, with some white privilege uh, that we knew how to navigate uh, the nonprofit world, uh, the foundation world. We thought we knew how to navigate the political world. Um, obviously things have been more complicated than we had imagined, um, but that we've committed ourselves to leveraging the resources to make it possible for our neighbors to share their stories with each other in the hopes that they would find empathy and ultimately solidarity leading to organization and action. So we had noticed over our years in the American Academy that uh, when professors retire, uh, they face quite a crisis, I should say we face, quite a crisis about what to do with our books and materials. Um, I use the metaphor of um, professors leaving piles of books outside the, the door of the office they are abandoning for students to pick through like bones in the desert. Um, and we wanted to offer our former colleagues and, and friends, not only at McAllister College where we had taught um, but really across the country and even across the world. I just got several boxes of books from an old friend who teaches in Wales, um, that we wanted to provide a new home uh, for those books. We wanted to shelve those books in a slightly unconventional way. Uh, that is, we wanted to shelve them in the collections as they were donated, um, because we believe that books that have been written in, full of marginal comments and underlinings are even more valuable than brand new books and that it's helpful to people who might use them to know who was the person who wrote, this guy needs to read more Marx or this is really bullshit uh, in the margins of books and, and to understand who had engaged those books those ways. We also wanted to encourage people who might use the books to think about how someone had developed their thinking over the course of a lifetime as manifested in the books that they had collected. So in eight years, we have now cataloged and shelved 27,000 books, um, mostly focused in immigration, labor, racial justice, gender justice, critical thinking about popular culture, um, and quite a number of books that are expressions of those issues in fiction, poetry, 
theater, visual art, memoir, uh, oral history, and beyond. We then launched uh, right from our start in 2014, uh, a pretty aggressive programming uh, strategy that we would invite authors uh, who had new books uh, to shake down their publishers and to get the publishers to send us three or four complimentary copies of the books that we could hand out uh, to people that we had relationships with for them to read and engage in public conversation with the authors. Um, I urge you, uh, when you visit our website, uh, go to the header that says media, and under media, you will find the YouTube uh, heading. Um, many of our programs are archived, videoed, and archived on the YouTube page, um, and you can see how this process of engaging authors in conversation as a way to open the door for wider conversation with audiences, um, how we've been doing that. So many of the issues that propelled us uh, to initiate the Eastside Freedom Library uh, were re-emphasized and exacerbated by the pandemic um, and the murder of George Floyd uh, in Minneapolis, which is the city right across the river. Um, and we've really realized that, that we were doing, the, we were on the right track, that um, inequity in wealth, in power, in public voice, uh, refracted through racism and xenophobia, uh, were laid bare by the pandemic, the murder of George Floyd uh, and the racial justice uprising that swept the Twin Cities, the country and much of the world, that we're on the right track. We also know how far we have to go. Um, and the pandemic particularly um, challenged us to figure out how to do what we were doing, sadly, without convening people in person. Um, although we have discovered in the last two years that our front lawn is a wonderful place to have programs. Uh, we've had the sort of interesting learning curve um, that because we're in a beautiful historic Carnegie Library building, with thick brick and stone walls, that we've had to get ethernet cables uh, in order to have wireless access out on the front lawn. Uh, the walls interfere with the Wi-Fi. Um, but we've been doing more and more programming on the lawn, uh, whether it is conversations with authors, poetry readings, theatrical performances, debates with city council and school board members, um, we've been trying to do more and more of it uh, in person. Um, we're also trying to learn how to use hybrid forms so that we can have an in-person experience, but also involve people in other places. Before the pandemic, um, we were doing a lot of work uh, with our diverse Ethiopian neighbors. We were approached by a group of Amharic poets who were looking for a place to have poetry readings where alcohol was not going to be served. Um, and we began to video their readings and live stream them by Facebook, um, and then later live stream them by Zoom uh, to people in uh, the Horn of Africa. And we had some poetry events that we realized up to 20,000 people were watching um, in East Africa. And, and so we were already beginning to discover uh, what Zoom and the internet were making possible uh, for us. So I wanna mention um, just a couple of things that, uh, that we've been doing um, to give you an idea of the range uh, of activities. Uh, we've been working on the issue of housing justice um, 
many of our neighbors struggle uh, to afford uh, appropriate housing. Uh, many of our immigrant neighbors have multi-generational families with large numbers of children um, and struggle to find living space that's adequate. Um, we are experiencing the long-term consequences of racism in access to housing. Um, here in Minnesota, there's been a very good research project called Mapping Prejudice, which looks at something called restrictive covenants, that much property in the early to mid 20th century came with deeds that forbid the owners from selling those properties to people of color, to Asians, to Jews. Uh, and uh, there's been a great deal of research and learning about that history and the consequences. For instance, even maps that overlay where there were exclusive neighborhoods and which neighborhoods today have adequate numbers of trees and which neighborhoods don't. And so we're, we're learning these long-term consequences and trying to bring our neighbors together to develop their self-confidence, to give them information about resources and how programs work, and encourage them to organize together um, to speak in a loud voice to city, state, and federal government, to developers and banks. So the housing justice work has been very important for us. Um, at the same time, we do things like make space available on a weekly basis to older Karen women who weave, and we're looking for a space to weave for the last four years, even during COVID, uh, wearing masks. Uh, these women have been coming to the library and weaving cloth, and, and I would say quite literally weaving community uh, while they're at it. They've been teaching uh, teenagers, uh, mostly girls, but a few boys, um, how to become weavers uh, as well. And they've become kind of folk heroes within their own community. And, um, and we have uh, events on the lawn where they sell the cloth that they've woven and um, more and more people are appreciating uh, the work of these Karen women. They're increasingly in conversation with Hmong women who, who have maintained an art form um, called pandao or story cloths, ways of telling their history through sewing. Um, and it's so exciting to see these women from different communities coming together, teaching each other their crafts and talking about the histories um, that they're expressing in, in the work that they're doing. Um, we organize an annual uh, union job fair uh, to encourage immigrants, uh, not just to seek jobs in unionized settings, but also to engage in conversation with the representatives of unions to learn what difference it makes if the nursing home that they work in or the hospital that they work in or the factory that they work in um, is unionized uh, as, as opposed to uh, non-union. It's also a way for us to encourage our friends in the labor movement to work harder to bring more diverse people into their workplaces and into their organizations. Um, we've been focusing since the murder of George Floyd uh, focusing on building solidarity between our African, African American, and Asian American neighbors, um, the way that racism and xenophobia have worked in the United States has tended to pit them against each other, uh, scrambling for what are overall inadequate resources, um, and instead to encourage them uh, to work together um, and, and to fight for a larger share of resources uh, from the society as a whole. Uh, we're working in uh, two projects in curriculum development. Uh, one is to uh, 
change what elementary school teachers are using to teach Minnesota history, to take the stories of indigenous people, particularly the Dakota, uh, and to bring their stories into the center of the narrative of Minnesota history. And we're working with a number of organizations in developing elementary school curriculum. And the deeper we get into the project, the more we're also wrestling with the need to reconsider the pedagogy that's used to teach such curriculum in elementary schools. We're continuing to learn. We're also working with a committee in the St. Paul Public Schools to develop a 10th grade course in critical ethnic studies that beginning in September will be mandatory for all high school students uh, in the city of St. Paul. Um, and we're working on what should be incorporated in that curriculum, um, which then also brings me to uh, where Helen started us, uh, mentioning her experience on the walking tour. Um, I have been leading walking tours and, and I would say, you know, inspired by what I experienced in New York City, uh, where there is a, what I think one of the most important museums in the country, uh, the Lower East Side Immigrant Tenement Museum uh, on Orchard Street um, in Southern Manhattan. And the people who run that museum also developed a neighborhood walking tour, um, which really taught me about the value of getting out, walking, looking, listening, smelling, all the things that we can learn by being, um, which is part of the pedagogy we're thinking about for elementary school kids, that, that they have to be out of the classroom, out of the building uh, to learn some of what we hope that they will learn. So I do these walking tours about immigrant history in St. Paul. Um, and um, I don't know, Helen, how am I doing on time? You're muted. Oop. Well, you have four minutes, Peter. Four minutes, very good. It's up to you whether you want to take any questions or whether you just- Great, why don't I stop there and, and see if, if anyone would, would wanna ask a question, make a comment. Good idea, thank you so much. That was oh, thank you. Fascinating. I'm so interested to hear about these curriculum development projects. I think that's wonderful and I already know, having been into schools in St. Paul, I know about some of the great work that's being done there, but these sound wonderful initiatives as well. Mm. So yeah, thank you so much, really fascinating yeah. to hear. We have a question, one question in the chat was about the books that you get, the books with the um, margin notes. So yes. do, do you have secondhand booksellers looking out for them for you, or do you have other sources? Do these books come from other academics or, or where do you get them from? So the, the books are coming from uh, retiring academics, uh, the children of academics who have passed away. Um, my favorite collection, we, we have a collection that was given to us um, by a remarkable Chinese American jazz musician and political activist uh, named Fred Ho. Uh, Fred was dying of colon cancer just as we were starting the library. Uh, and he shipped us his books. Uh, they are amazing, uh, an amazing collection um, and heavily, heavily uh, full of marginal marginalia. We've actually had two graduate students over the years um, who were doing research on Fred and they came and, um, and as you all know, you know, we live in this era now where everyone has a smartphone and you can take pictures of everything. And, and they were taking pictures of the marginalia in Fred's books, which became part of their PhD dissertations. And the old academic that I am, I said that they were turning secondary sources into primary sources uh, in the ways that they were using them. So um, that's, you know, we're, I still buy books, uh, but they then tend to be new. Uh, and, and I'm adding them to the collections. Um, but, but most of, and I like to say that with the books, 
has come spirit. And I feel like the spirits of many of the people who have given us books. Uh, Tony Randolph, who was an African-American lesbian journalist at Minnesota Public Radio. Um, after she passed away, her brothers gave us her books. Uh, Hi Berman, who was a historian of Jewish immigrant labor experiences and Minnesota farmer laborism. Hi's kids gave us his books after he passed away. Um, my friend Paula Rabinowitz, who taught uh, feminist literature at the University of Minnesota, when she downsized, uh, gave, us, gave us her books. So um, the books bring a lot uh, into the space and a, and a lot of meaning uh, for us. Um, Beth and I will often say when we're confronted with what seems like a questionable opportunity, like some bank that wants to give us money and we're not sure we want to be associated with them, we say, well, what would Fred have said? So Fred would have told them to go fuck themselves. Uh, and so we, we take that to heart um, in critical moments of which path should we follow. Is there perhaps another question? Well, I just want to ask that we need to finish off this very short time. Yes. But for people who haven't been lucky enough to visit the library, is it open most of the time? If people were in St. Paul, would they be able to turn up and come into the library? Yeah, we're, we're still asking in the pandemic that people make an appointment. Um, we're there a lot. Uh, and we ask people still to wear masks. We do as well. Um, we would love to see you. Um, when you visit the website, um, and, and I think in the header about us um, uh, or about, um, there is actually a 3D tour uh, of the library that some friends put together. Um, so you can get a bit of the experience of what the space is like. Um, we do like to tell people that as a so-called Carnegie Library, um, that this is a building that was paid for uh, by the exploited labor of immigrant iron miners, coal miners, and steel workers who made Andrew Carnegie the richest man in America in the early 20th century and enabled him to become a so-called philanthropist. So we, we like to make those points right up front um, so people understand what we're about. Absolutely. Absolutely. And Oh, Marcelo's just saying, would you like to have a signed and dedicated copy of his book, which is called The Joy of Not Knowing? I have a copy here. Wonderful. I, I Yes, library. absolutely. Um, you can find our mailing address on the website. Um, all of you out there, if you've written books and would like to send us one, we would love to have them. And I would also say, if you've written something recently that you'd really like to call attention to, reach out to me and we can plan one of these conversations with an author. And I can find some pretty interesting local people um, to read your book and engage with you um, about it. That's a wonderful offer. Thank you so much, Peter, and thank you, Marcelo, for that. So now we need to move on to the panel. So stay where you are, Peter, because you'll be I our will. second speaker on the panel. So if I can just make sure that Mike has prepped all the other panel members. So... The panel are going to discuss a question. So the question is, what does the future of education for peace look like? So to start off with, thank you very much, Shona. Hello, everyone. I hope you have, have had a wonderful day. Um, really interesting conference. It's been a joy to listen to everybody. Um, I won't talk for five minutes, but I have a few kind of things for us to ponder on, really. I think it's a real challenge or it might be a challenge for some of us, especially young people, to visualise what peace might look like and how we achieve that in a time when conflict seems to feature so largely in the world today. Um, I'm talking to you from the UK um, and even within the UK, there's much in the way of conflict when we talk, we look at you know, the issues with Northern Ireland at the moment and the, the border uh, and the, 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 the discussions that we're having with the EU, I think people would prefer we use the word discussion rather than conflict, but, you know, people don't agree. And, and by definition, that, that, is a, that is a conflict of ideas, at least. We've also got in Europe, 
a real attention draw in the shape of Ukraine and what that means and, and the questions that that brings up for our young people. It certainly brings up questions for my children around the, around the kitchen table. We have, we can see disruption and war in Afghanistan, in Syria. And we also have questions around our kitchen table about the way those things are presented, how refugees and conflict and wars presented in Ukraine and how that is presented in the rest of the world and even a conflict around how we present those ideas and how we present those similar circumstances in very different ways and then we can see looking across to our neighbors in across the water to america and the disagreement around gun laws so i think there's a lot that would catch the attention of young people today and perhaps they might feel there isn't a great deal of peace in the world and maybe they also reflect on their own circumstances at home. Um, and maybe they also reflect on, you know, the impact of social media and the internal conflicts they might feel um, there. So I think the piece of the future of peace really is in the hands of the next generation. I feel like I don't feel particularly old, but that even my generation have messed it up already. Um, and, you know, I think actually that it's, it's in the hands of the next generation to to deal with it and I think our responsibility now is how do we facilitate young people to lead in creating a peaceful world how do we facilitate that what do we need to do as adults to provide young people with the, the skills and the tools how do we create future leaders to do a better job than we've done how do we develop a sense of curiosity in young people rather than you know, becoming a really polarised and doubling down world. How do we create curiosity and, and generate conversation and a, 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 a wanting to learn from other people to understand and that listening to understand? Um, how do we implement equity, diversity and inclusion strategies in our schools? Um, that's something that I do regularly, but how do we make sure that that is a long term thing that is meaningful? that has impact and that you can measure progress and how do we make sure that actually happens and then finally how do we how do we draw their attention to work for social justice um across you know all areas of life all types of people um so i guess i haven't spoken but asked a lot of questions <laughs> really um and i'll stop there thank you very much Shona. they're all very pertinent questions and things that that we all need to consider. So thank you very much. So handing over now to Peter. Thank you. And, and thank you for your question, Chandra. Um, you know, we, a couple things about the United States. Uh, one is we, we try to express knowledge in bumper stickers. And uh, there was a popular bumper sticker, um, if you want peace, work for justice. And, and I think that a lot of the educational work that we're trying to do is to encourage young people to think about justice and to think about the, the fundamental inequities um, that, well, I used to say, or I still say, that the M Karl Marx's theory of history in a nutshell, this could also be a bumper sticker, uh, is that, um, History deals you a hand of cards. You decide how to play them. I think education is in part about making sure that young people get cards that actually have truth in them. Um, and we're in quite a battle in the United States um, about curriculum, uh, the push against so-called critical race theory. Um, this past week, I was able to lead a conversation um, about the remarkable book put together uh, by Nicole Hannah-Jones from the New York Times called The 1619 Project um, to really engage with people and ask them, uh, as, as Nicole Hannah-Jones puts it, um, what is your origin story? What do you think the beginnings of the United States are? And what is the consequences and legacy uh, of those origins? 
And so we're, we're trying to make sure that kids get access to accurate information about uh, the expropriation of indigenous people, about the transatlantic slave trade, about uh, the exploitation of immigrants. Um, our friend Erica Lee at the University of Minnesota has recently published a book called America for Americans, uh, a history of xenophobia. Um, so we're trying to present that information and then we're trying to find learning strategies, pedagogical strategies um, that enable kids to take ownership. So I'll, I'll tell one hopefully quick story and, and get out of the way. And um, there is a, a program in the United States called National History Day. And hundreds of thousands of middle school and high school students engage in research projects uh, around a theme. And, uh, and we see a lot of those kids at the Eastside Freedom Library and, and help them with directing them to resources and engaging them in conversations. Two years ago, the theme was called Breaking Barriers. And we had three young women come to the library, seventh graders, who were interested in telling the story of an African-American woman journalist named Ethel Payne. And Ethel Payne went from the Chicago Defender in the 1950s, where she had covered the funeral of Emmett Till to becoming the first black woman in the White House press corps. And when she hit Washington in 1955, she confronted President Eisenhower about the construction of the interstate highway system and why was there no regulation against Jim Crow segregation on the new federal highway system that was being built? And these kids completely fell in love with Ethel Payne. Were, and, and she was someone I have to admit, I had not heard of un, until these three young women came into the library. And together we found resources about her but we also found in her a role model for these kids, how they could be active in any field of endeavor on behalf of justice. And they were telling the story of this role model. So I'm gonna stop there and I'm, I'm optimistic, even though the United States is a mess, um, but, but I'm, every day my interaction with young people makes me optimistic. Thank you. Well, to hear that, Peter, and thank you very much. Very much, Helen. Um, thank you also, Shona, for your very wise prompts. And Peter, oh. yes, for um, some very, very interesting insight, which I think has been really, really valuable. I, I've reflected, I think, for a very long time on the future of education, particularly in organisations that consider themselves to be future-facing. Um, but which live with a history or a legacy of um, innate and systemic uh, prejudices and, and, uh, you know, and inequalities. And I think the question throws up the whole idea, the, the question about the future of education throws up, I think, implicitly, um, the whole notion of leadership, which in turn, I think, branches out probably to the question of the will to change, the will to improve the world, a clarity of vision, but then I think we're always butting heads um, with the with with kind of the meta world, and I think we we still live in a in a world where in our minds things are polarized. Um, in our minds, things are, you know we we major on difference. Um, we we look at the world in a bipartisan uh, binary kind of way. And I think that one of the, th the things that I'm beginning to think more and more is about the reality of the VUCA world. You know, I think it was a term, uh, Peter, you'll be able to correct me on this, but I think it was a term first used in 1992 um, by the American Air Force when they were working on their um, military sort of policies um, to go into countries, particularly in the Middle East when they were working out their foreign policy. And I think that they realized then, okay, that we were going into a world that was becoming increasingly fragmented. So a world that was volatile, 
uncertain, complex and ambiguous. So I think that, um, you know, because we live in a world that is becoming increasingly fragmented, it's becoming increasingly difficult for us to hold all the divergent parts together. So how does one do that? How does one bring together, you know, a, a world where people are always othering um, other people? And I think that, you know, one of the ways in which to do that is to recognize that when someone is in conflict with another person, I'm not a psychologist, you know, disclaimer, um, that when someone is in conflict with someone else, there is an unheard or an unacknowledged need at the center of it. And I think if we can unify around getting as many people's voices heard and their needs responded to, then that is perhaps the beginning of the compassion education that we are working towards, you know, that the International Baccalaureate aspires to, that Kurt Hahn constructed in his imagination um, in the backdrop to programs like the um, International Baccalaureate. And there are really simple ways to do this. Peter, I come back to your point, you know, narratology and the whole idea of narrative and storytelling is so innate and so natural to human beings that to simply bring people together and to hear their stories is just one of the multifarious ways that we can go, that we can proceed to make people feel that their needs are acknowledged, that they are being heard, and where we can lead in a way that is specific to what and is authentic and is authentic. And I think that when people feel authenticity, they respond in a like manner. So those, those are my opening thoughts. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shamila. That was really fascinating and insightful. Thank you. Molly, are you ready to speak now? And can I just introduce Molly? Uh, Molly Matlotlo, who is an uh, SDG 4, 5 and 10 practitioner and an ESL master trainer at Rhodes University in Johannesburg. Thank you, Molly. So my thoughts around this whole thing. OK, so in South Africa, we have a tricky history that everybody knows about with apartheid and all of that. But what also happened in that history is that we were othered, you know, the whole point was to divide and conquer, right? And not only within South Africa, but across the continent. So when other countries were getting their independence and things were off to a shaky start and things like that, the narrative was constantly, do you want to look like them? see what happens. So almost the scaring of people to say, unless you are controlled and managed in this way, things are going to be that bad, right? Um, and so as a result, South Africans don't really, don't really know what other Africans know about the rest of the continent. We exist in this little bubble. We very much think we're doing so much better down here uh, than everywhere else on the continent because, you know, of that narrative that no, independence for Africans is not good. Um, and as a result, we've had a lot of xenophobic attitudes and even attacks um, happening on the continent. And because of that, it's been so bad that when we do engage with others and when others do come to the continent, I mean, to the country from the rest of the continent, it is, it's bad. It is bad because we don't know of the other. And there's this insane otherness that we want Africans to be towards other Africans. Um, and so because of that and all of that xenophobic uh, thingy, We've started, I'm in materials development, so what we do is uh, develop materials learning, and I'm, I've been very deliberate about including stories from the rest of the continent in, in our storytelling, in the stories that we use, be it in textbooks or be it whatever, using names, something simple as a name, and then maybe later referring to what the name means, or when some character has been true to their name or little phrases that kids 
it's a word like asking for help, 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 or in another language from the rest of the continent. Or if it's saying, oh, a thief, a thief. I remember the one story was saying, wheezy, wheezy, or a word like that. And it's a word for thief in uh, Swahili. Um, so the, those are small ways in which, you know, you're trying to sort of bridge that gap between the otherness that has been created because there is very low education um, in what I think needs to go towards, you know, peace on the content and, but their efforts. But anyway, this is just my little corner of, um, of that and what we do in the spaces that I'm in. Um, and yeah, Hopefully there'll be other bigger strides, but um, we're starting somewhere. We will go somewhere. And that's what Molly does in her little corner. Thank you very much, Molly. That was really wonderful to have a really different perspective. So thank you very much indeed. And we'll finish off the introductory uh, points with Anne Ambiti, who is the national coordinator for the UNESCO ASPNet UK. Thank you, Anne. Wow, what a day it's been today. Um, well, I think that today has really shown what wonderful work in education is taking place already. I have really loved how people have been sharing and connecting today. And I'm just going to talk very briefly on a couple of the themes that have come up for me, um, which are curriculum development. I think we need to get more creative and ensure everyone has the opportunity that they need for them. and. Um, I think how we develop ourselves as educators in terms of reflecting on our own personal biases and stereotypes is key when we're looking at that. Shona uh, suggested earlier that we should visit our curriculums and ask ourselves what diet are our young people getting in a cum cum cumulative sense and I think we should all be reflecting um, on the words we use, um, the stereotypes that are in our heads, because we've all got them. And I think that's really important that we do that. Um, and one of the ways that we do that is by listening to others, sharing our stories, encouraging other people and giving them the safe space to share their stories. I think that's been, you know, particularly um, for young people. They often think that their voices are not heard. Um, many of the conversations I have with young people is that, you know, why do I need to learn about history? It's irrelevant to me. Um, why, you know, should I join the conversation? Because nobody listens. And I think we need to change that. Um, Marcelo shared with us the idea that we need school leadership that equips all children to thrive emotionally, socially, culturally, and academically. Because I think in many of our curriculums, the focus is on the academic and testing children. Um, and that leads, as we all know, to massive mental health problems. And I think, you know, that is something that we should look at. Um, and just finally, I would like to say that I think, I would really hope that well, I'll use your word, Peter. I am optimistic <laughs> that everybody here today will work together on the UNESCO ASPNET Arts and Culture for Peace initiative, which we launched this morning. And also, I think we will work in many other ways. I think um, we are all connected and we need to remember that today more than ever. And um, I think I shall leave it there. Thank you very much, Anne. That's brilliant. Thank you. It's good to hear about people being optimistic. So now I'm going to start with the questions, but do feel anybody that you can put questions into the chat as well. But I have a few questions which have already been submitted. So I'm going to start with this question. What steps have you taken recently to promote international mindedness? So I'm going to start with Shamila. Shamila, would you like to answer that question first, please? Um, thank you very much. So one of the, I, I think one of the natural advantages of doing a program like the International Baccalaureate, but not, of course, exclusive to the International Baccalaureate, is that by following that program, one of necessity has a second language. 
Okay, so um, if one is fortunate enough, I think, to work in a school where there is space to have that discussion about um, empowering students through a second language, that's great, that's fantastic. But we have also very recently um, developed a language policy where we are very, very clear about the use of language within the college and within the curriculum, but then also around and outside the curriculum. So, for example, you know, students are given the opportunity to um, do a modern foreign language within the curriculum, sometimes too. That's great. That's wonderful. Um, that's our academic diet. Outside, however, we've taken great strides, particularly with our international students, to get them to speak in their mother tongue, to get to encourage them to not end up with a kind of deficit bilingualism. Because I think in a colonized world, we all live with a world with the supremacy of English, where people learn English and do their follow their studies and find themselves in in, in um, academic contexts where English is prioritized at the cost to the mother tongue. So that's something that we've met head on. But there is, and I think that for Molly, this will be particularly fascinating coming from a country where there are what sixteen, I think, um, national languages, Molly. Yeah. Um, and actually, 11, 11. Gosh, I should know that. I'm embarrassed. Anyway. And but then we also have worked very hard um, on student leadership. And this is something that I think is a piece of work that's never done, where the students have put together a document about what is acceptable language for them in their time and what isn't. So we have the students have been brilliant in really meeting challenges um, in talking about why for them certain language constitutes a slur and why and other people have you know used their right of reply why for other people that is not the case and that is as I say you know in this very complex world that we're all living in that is we're never going to settle on a point what is important is the dialogue so I think so that's one of the ways in which we have promoted international mindedness we are very keen, of course, to celebrate um, festivals, to celebrate people's heritage, to, so we run two calendars. We run the academic calendar, and at the same time, we run the United Nations calendar in our school, so that certain days are highlighted right from the outset, and certain days are celebrated. Next week, for example, we are holding Diversity Week. Okay, we participate in all kinds of fora um, as a school, to bring people in to educate ourselves. There is this, I, I think we are what Peter Senge referred to as a learning organization way back in the 90s, that we are constantly engaged in the process of educating ourselves. And one of the ways we do that, and I'd love to invite all of you to this, is um, the leadership college that we run here at Hockerall, where we actually focus specifically on international mindedness and leadership. So Shamila, that's, that's wonderful, but we do have to give other people a chance to speak. <laughs> I'm going to go next to Peter. So, Peter, what would you say? I mean, obviously, we've heard lots of things that you'd already said, but if you were to highlight a few points, what would you say? We try to operate with the concept of diaspora and, and talk with young people about diaspora throughout history and how to position themselves within to, to be intentional about understanding uh, their location within uh, diaspora, um, whether they are uh, Hmong or Oromo, uh, to, to give them a grounding in the history of other uh, immigrants who have uh, had an impact on the future of the country that they left um, because of their access to resources and solidarities within the United States. So um, diaspora has been a really important concept uh, for us. Um, I, I want to encourage you, if you have the time and interest, to look at the YouTube video of the presentation a week ago that a young uh, Hmong poet, uh, my name Vang, uh, presented about the ways that she is sort of crafting a new language. Uh, Hmong people came to the United States without a written language. Um, they came from different regions 
in Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam, and originally in China. Um, and so there were different dialects. And here within the diaspora in the United States, after 30 odd years, a new version of the language Hmong is emerging syncretic from these different uh, specific groups within the community. And this young woman who is a poet um, and is actually on the verge of a PhD in education policy uh, at the University of Wisconsin, but through her poetry, she is trying to test out a new version of her language and makes a wonderful case for it uh, in, in her presentation. So um, that's, that's my name, Vang, uh, in our videos. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. That's wonderful. That's a really good uh, recommendation to see that video. Would you mind just putting in the chat the title of that video? Because I think that would help people to find it on YouTube. Thank you very much indeed. Sure. I'm now going to ask Shona and then Molly, and then I'll be handing out to Anne to close the conference. So, Shona. Thanks, Helen. Um, no, I think that's a really in question, interesting question um, to reflect on. And my, my thoughts in terms of what have I done to promote international mindedness has been very much about looking at things from different perspectives. And I think that's something that I try to convey in the workshop that I did earlier on. So an example um, that came to my attention recently um, was I'm, I'm a governor at a primary school in, in, in Nottingham um, and they were talking about raising money for Ukraine and the children were very keen to raise some money for Ukraine. And I just posed to them, you know, what did the school do to raise money for Afghanistan? what did the school do to raise money for Syria? And of course the answer came back, nothing. Um, and I try not to sit in judgment about that because people don't know what they don't know. So I just sort of said, you know, the presentation of how those, some, those situations are being delivered to us um, is very different. You know, the Ukrainian refugees are blonde and blue eyed. And um, these refugees are not those things. They're um, often Muslim, they have brown skin and and it's interesting that we aren't responding the same way and it gave pause for thought around the table it gave them an opportunity to just reflect on how they view different issues we continued with the conversation and this particular school has got 35 different home languages uh, and on the notice board in the school they have pictures of the children and they say next to them their flag they, they, from, their, from their country of origin and the language that they speak. And a parent came in and asked the school to take the picture of her child down. And it was because she's Russian and she didn't want any stigma or any negativity directed at her child who was Russian. And it gave me pause for thought that actually we've got a situation here where we need to look at situations from a wide range of perspectives that yes, of course, um, we might, I might have because of my origins, a perspective on how the wars in different parts of the world are communicated to us in the West. And I might have a perspective on how the support that we as a nation have given Ukraine that we have not given elsewhere um, but we also have to think about, actually, there are other people involved in this. And there's a little girl who doesn't feel safe from to school because she's Russian. And that's a problem. So um, what I would say is always have an intersectional approach, looking at things from as many different perspectives as you can possibly think of. And where you have diversity, you are able to have challenge. So someone's able to challenge me, who's there on my soapbox talking about you know the press and how they've presented different wars being challenged in a really positive way so where we can try and take challenge and listen to learn i think that is the best way we can be internationally minded thank you very much shona those are excellent points thank you and i'm going to ask molly and then when i hand over to Anne, i'll ask Anne for any concluding points for the panel and also be um asking Anne to close the conference as well so Molly, anything else that you'd like to add about international mindedness? For me, 
Um, again, in my little circle, in my little corner. Um, so part of what I do when I train, um, okay, I, sometimes I train literacy coaches and other times I go to the schools directly to work with the teachers. So we do little activities, um, especially around phonics, so that they begin to really understand what we mean by phonemic awareness and phonetics, right? And so because the science of reading is actually new to all of us, you know, some of the ways, trusted ways that we were teaching reading haven't really been working out all that well. So now there's an emphasis on phonics, right? So I will make them write um, a sentence and it's words they've never heard before, words they've never seen before, a language they've never spoken. I have Swahili and Japanese as my tiny little other languages. Um, then they'll be able to write that down. Then I ask them, how were you able to write that down? Have you, is this a language you speak? No, what language is it? I'm like, it's Japanese. They're like, what? I just wrote Japanese. I'm like, yeah, you just did. How did you do that? And they're like, no, we just listened to what you were saying and you're able to write it down. I'm like, you see, so you have master phonics. It's about the sounds and the letters. It doesn't matter that it's a language you don't speak nor understand, right? And then I'll write a sentence maybe in Swahili and I'll make them read it. And they're able to decode it correctly and read it, but they don't know what it means and they don't even know what they're saying. I'm like, oh, you guys just spoke beautiful really there. They're like, what does it mean? And I'm like, you just said you are beautiful. <laughs> and then they're like, oh, I'm going to use that. I'm going to use that. And then, and then they start using that because it just sounds cool. And they're like, actually, it's kind of similar to our language. Um, it, it's kind of similar. Oh, it sounds like one or other language. I'm like, actually, Swahili is a really cool language to learn. And then I'll do the same exercise, but now not using the Roman alphabet for the Japanese. I'll write it in um, hiragana or katakana. Um, I can't write in kanji, but <laughs> the other two, right? And then I'll ask them what that is, and they're clueless. They're like, we don't know what this is. What are these sticks? Then I, then I make them realize that the same thing you read earlier or the same thing you were able to write earlier is this, but it's in a different writing system. So this means what you have also mastered, not just phonics and the letters which represent them, is that the letters that represent them are particularly from a specific alphabet system. It's the Roman alphabet system. This is one of the Japanese ones that you don't know. Oh, okay. So other countries have a writing system? Yes. But if when you use the same writing system, but with different, obviously different, you know, same sounds with different meaning and putting them together, then they sort of realize. So it's just that. Then they start chatting to me about like, how come you know all these languages? It's because I take travel and I'm curious about other people and places. And then they're like, isn't it expensive? And I'm like, no, you can do it too. <laughs> and these are teams in rural South Africa. <laughs> and I'm like, do it. You can even volunteer. Because, um, you know, I picked up Sahil in Kenya when I was volunteering. I'm like, during your school holidays, what are you doing? Not much, we kind of on holiday, I'm like, go volunteer. Go volunteer in other places <laughs> on the continent and have you a free holiday, but a meaningful one. So yeah, <laughs> that's kind of what Thank I you, do in my little thing. That's wonderful. Really fascinating. And I love you. Love the way you just say really modestly, all oh, my other languages are Japanese and Swahili. I'm like, oh, awesome, Molly. Thank you so much. So I just would like now to thank the panel. Every member of the panel has contributed so much and we've had so many diverse views and opinions from Peter, Shona, Shamila and Molly. Thank you very, very much indeed. We've all benefited from your insights today. Thank you. And before I hand over to Anne, I would just like to thank her hugely because Anne has been the driving force behind this conference and she's been the person who's got it all together and made it happen. So absolutely fantastic, Anne. And now I hand over to Anne Beattie to close the conference. Anne. Thank you, everybody, um, for today. Um, I'm completely blown away by everybody's contribution. Um, it is, I mean, I feel it's been amazing for me. I've learned so much, and I hope all of you have learned many interesting things too. And thank you, Helen, and everybody for... Um, thanking me but I've got some very special thanks to give to everybody. Um, I want to thank our very generous speakers um, today and all the workshop hosts and all of the UNESCO ASP Net schools and coordinators who shared what I hope you will find inspirational work 
um, at this conference today. We will be sharing the work um, maybe in a week or so once we've got ourselves together. But I really have to give special thanks to Mike and Lucy Fleetham, who have been instrumental in sorting out the technical staff, um, doing the slides, keeping us all on track, the Steve Sinnott Foundation for sponsoring um, the work, and the team behind the scenes, Helen, Sophia, Liz, Shamala, who, you know, have been talking about this and putting this conference together for some months. It, you know, it's taken quite a lot of work. And our two sponsors, um, Contemplative Photography, which you'll see the links to, and STEM Unity, who have been sponsoring us. So um, that's all from me. Thank you everyone for making today such a special day.